Chapter 12 Dark Destiny Consciousness came with crushing pain. Kern's breaths were shallow, burning gasps. He couldn't seem to move his arms or legs. The darkness was suffocating. I must be dreaming again, he whispered hoarsely. It is no dream, Kern, an eerie voice spoke in the gloom. Kern sighed in relief. Miltiades, where are we? In this darkness, who can say? The undead paladin replied from somewhere nearby. Then let's cast a little light on the subject, a familiarly flippant voice added. Zarija! Pale silver light broke through the darkness. Maybe casting a light spell wasn't such a good idea after all, Listel remarked bleakly as her eyes surveyed the scene. Sometimes things look better in the dark. The five adventurers were being held captive in a catacomb of some sort. Yellowed bone lashed together with dried sinew bonded them to five shallow stone alcoves. Kern craned his head to see Dale and Miltiades to his left, struggling in vain against the skeletal bonds. Listel and Serana were pinned tightly to his right. Kern tried to move his arms, but the scabrous bones only tightened cruelly. They were trapped. I have a feeling we aren't the first guests ever to visit this enchanting place, Listel observed with a gulp. Kern saw that more alcoves lined the catacomb's walls in either direction. Many were occupied. A mummified owl bear opened its maw in an endless scream, and several decomposing hobgoblins clawed at their bonds, shriveled faces twisted into masks of horror. The elf, face pale, chewed her lip. And something tells me that getting... In is a whole lot easier than getting out. Serana, can you cast a spell that might free us? Kern asked the wild mage. She shook her head. Not if I can't move my hands. Her dark eyes flashed in frustration. Powerful magic requires intricate gestures. I can't simply wiggle my ears and teleport us out of here. An idea struck Kern. Listel, couldn't you simply pass right through your bonds? You do it with walls all the time. I already thought of that, Kern. Unfortunately, I can only pass through inanimate objects. Listel grimaced as the skeletal arms tightened their hold on her. And these things are definitely not inanimate. Perhaps you should not focus on your bonds, Listel. Miltiades suggested. Her small, elven nose wrinkled. Wait a minute, I understand. The bones holding me may be animate, but the stones aren't. Her ruby pendant flared brightly. Without warning, the elf sank backward into the stone wall of the alcove. Long moments passed. Abruptly, Listel stepped out of a basaltic column carved with twisted gargoyles. Ugh, she said disgustedly. That was definitely not pleasant. You really wouldn't believe the stuff that accumulates behind walls in places like this. She hastily brushed bits of dried cobweb and ancient grime from her green tunic. Now, let me see what I can do about these uncooperative bones, Kern. However... Try as she might, none of Listel's spells and no amount of tugging could break the scabrous bonds. All right, Kern, there's one last thing I can try. Listel took a deep breath. I was hoping it wouldn't come to this, but I don't think I have much choice. Listel, what in the world are you talking about? Kern asked in exasperation. Just hold on tight, and whatever you do, don't let go. Her ruby necklace glowing, Listel disappeared into the floor. Kern wondered what the unpredictable elf was up to. Moments later, 
He found out as two slender hands reached out of the stones behind him and jerked him backward right through the solid surface of the wall. It was far worse than any nightmare. Kern could feel the rock passing through his body with a hideous slithering sensation. Solid stone filled his heart and lungs, almost choking him. It was horrible. After what seemed an eternity, Listel hauled him up through the catacomb's floor. He gasped for breath. The others stared in surprise. Next time, just let me starve to death, Listel, Kern said, shuddering in revulsion. It couldn't be any worse than that. He hauled himself to his feet as the elf slumped weakly against a column, her face alarmingly pale. Listel, are you all right? Miltiades asked in concern. She nodded. I'm fine, really. Are you sure? Kern asked. He reached out to grip the elf's shoulder, but his fingers passed right through her. I said I'm fine, Listel snapped stumbling away from him. Do you hear me? Now why don't you see to the others with that precious hammer of yours? She retreated into the shadows. Kern gaped at his hand. Had it simply been his imagination? He wondered if the others had seen what he had seen. But no, he realized his body blocked their view. Shaking his head, he turned his attention to his companions. One blow of Primal's enchanted warhammer was all it took to shatter the skeletal bonds. In moments, Dale, Miltiades, and Serana were free. Listel stepped from the shadows to rejoin them. It was only then, as they all stood together, that Kern realized one of the companions was missing. He had been so preoccupied with their predicament that he had not noticed until now. Dale, he asked the young ranger with a frown, where is Wren? The look in her eyes made his heart stop. He watched her with growing dread. Dale swallowed hard, stumbling over the words. Her voice was bleak. We were attacked by a fiend outside the guard tower she finally managed to say, her voice trembling. He slew it, but it, it, she drew a ragged breath. My father is dead, she said quietly. Ren of the Blade is dead. Miltiades hung his head. Then this day, Veron has become a darker place indeed. Now, where to? Dale asked, sticking a pair of arrows into her leather belt. Not a quarter hour before, Dale had broken down in tears as she told the story of her father's death. Now a cold light shone in her eyes, and there was a grim set to her jaw. This way, Kern said, pointing in one direction. He wasn't sure how to get out of the catacomb, but it was almost as if he heard a faint trilling in his mind showing him the way. You hear the voice of Tyre's hammer, don't you? Miltiades asked him softly. I, I think so, Miltiades. Kern cocked his ear, listening closely. The trilling had grown slightly louder. The undead paladin nodded. Your destiny calls you, Hammer Seeker. Kern led the way into a long, roughly hewn corridor, which spiraled off into the darkness. The corridor opened into a large chamber. With a word, Serana conjured a small spark and flung it upward. When it struck the ceiling high above, it burst into a brilliant glowing ball, illuminating the chamber. I could have done that. Listel grumbled, banishing her own smaller puff of pale, silvery light with a perturbed gesture. The chamber appeared to be a throne room of some sort. Two dark rows of columns, each carved in the form of a beast-faced pit fiend, supported the high-domed ceiling. In the chamber's center was a raised dais bearing an onyx throne. Are you certain we're heading the right way, Kern? 
Listel asked, scrambling over the remnants of once opulent furniture. I don't see any way out of here. This has to be right, Listel. He cocked his head and nodded. Yes, the hammer song was clear. Suddenly he frowned. He could hear another sound as well, like a distant groaning. He glanced at the others. By their puzzled expressions, they heard it also. Rapidly the noise grew louder, building to a roar that echoed down the corridor. What is it? Dale asked, gripping her bow with a white-knuckled hand. Does that answer your question? Listel pointed silvery eyes wide. A small army of blank-eyed creatures lumbered into the chamber. Some were human in form, others elven or dwarven. All of them were horribly decayed. A putrid, overpowering reek preceded them. Jagged bones stuck out through their mottled skin, and chunks of flesh fell from their limbs as they moved. Their eyes bulged as they hungrily stretched out their arms. Ghouls, Miltiades shouted to the others, arm yourselves. The first wave of creatures shambled within reach, bearing their broken teeth. Like zombies, ghouls were undead, raised from the grave with evil magic. But unlike zombies, ghouls had an insatiable hunger for living flesh. Only Miltiades was of no interest to them. Kern swung his warhammer in a blazing arc, smashing through the heads of the first two ghouls. Their bodies collapsed to the floor, twitching. In revulsion, Kern shook gobbets of rotting flesh off his weapon. Dale loosed several arrows in rapid succession into the chest of another ghoul. The creature momentarily staggered backward, then continued forward, oblivious to the shafts protruding from its body. Realizing her bow was useless, the ranger quickly slung it over her shoulder and drew the magical daggers right and left from her boots. She slashed out at a ghoul reaching for her. The enchanted blades sliced through the thing's flesh. Both of its arms dropped to the floor with a sickening plop. The ghoul stumbled away in a daze. With his broadsword, Miltiades was cutting a wide swath through the horde of undead. Listel uttered the words of a spell, and suddenly a half-dozen of the ghouls were transformed into healthy, live humans and elves. It was an illusion, of course. However, seeing apparently living beings in their midst sent a score of ghouls into a frenzy. They dragged the illusory creatures to the floor and began to feed on them. Kern had lost count of how many ghouls his warhammer crushed into a pulp. Magical lightning sizzled and crackled constantly over the ranks of the undead, charring them to ashes, the work of Serana's magic. Yet, despite the broken, twitching bodies that piled up, still more ghouls shambled forward. Kern's heart pounded in his chest. He wasn't certain how long he could keep up the steady onslaught of his hammer. But the moment he stopped, the ghouls would drag him down with their clammy hands and start feasting. He kept fighting. A cry of pain snapped his gaze around. He saw Dale stagger backward. A ghoul had torn a ragged gouge the length of her arm. Swiftly, Miltiades stepped next to her, cleaving the filthy ghoul in two with one swing of his sword. The ranger clenched her jaw against the pain as she continued to lash out with her deadly daggers. We can't keep this up forever, Kern shouted, shattering the ribcage of a dwarven ghoul. Well, we can't exactly stop either, Listel retorted. A trio of ghouls lunged toward her, only to impale themselves on a rack of ancient, rusted spears the elf had turned magically invisible. The Hammer Warder's dark magic has summoned every being that has ever perished in this valley, Miltiades explained. He decapitated a female ghoul clad in a rotting silk gown. This has always been a place of evil and peril. I can only guess 
that thousands of lives have ended in this vale. I think there is a way to stop the ghouls from coming, Sarana said, though I had hoped not to have to resort to it. From beneath her gown, she drew out a strangely shaped amulet of polished bone and pointed a finger toward the chamber's entrance. The stone archway began to glow a dull orange, then a fiery red. Molten rock flowed down, incinerating a dozen ghouls. In moments, the molten rock began to cool and solidify. Soon, the entrance was sealed by a dark, shapeless blob of solid stone. The adventurers swiftly dispatched the remaining creatures, reducing them to putrid-smelling heaps of carrion and bone. Exhausted, they slumped on the dais before the onyx throne, gasping for breath. Except for Miltiades, who seemed tireless. Your spell did the trick, Serana, Kern said, his chest heaving. Why did you wait so long to use it? I had hoped not to have to use the amulet, the wild mage replied. It may have stopped the flood of ghouls, but it has also sealed off the way out of this chamber. They saw to their battle wounds then. Most had escaped with only a few bruises, but the gash on Dale's arm was more urgent. A wound caused by a ghoul's filthy claws invariably festered, poisoning the blood. Eventually the victim would die and become a ghoul. Fear not, Dale. Miltiades reassured the ranger. He knelt beside her, removing his gauntlets, and whispered a brief prayer to Tyre. A blue nimbus sprang to life about his skeletal hands. In moments, the gouge on Dale's arm closed and scabbed over. Miltiades nodded in satisfaction, replacing his gauntlets. It is done. She sighed in relief. Thanks, Miltiades. Kern gazed at his own hands wistfully. He wondered if there would ever be a paladin's healing in their touch. He shrugged and put the thought out of his mind. They had more pressing matters to worry about. None of these walls are illusory, Listel proclaimed in disgust after searching the throne room for the third time. And I can't find the slightest hint of any hidden doorways. I thought Elvenkind had particularly keen eyes in such matters, Serana murmured. The wild mage was examining a bruise on Kern's arm where his armor had been dented. This is absurd, Dale exclaimed in exasperation. I can't believe we've journeyed all this way and been through... through so much just to end up locked in a room full of moldering old junk. She kicked a broken table out of her way, feeling weary. She climbed the marble dais and plopped down into the massive onyx throne. It was so large that her feet swung freely in the air. Each of the throne's arms ended in gnarled, fiendish claws. Dale gripped them tightly in frustration. The right claw moved. She sat up with a jolt, fearing the throne was enchanted. Then she realized that the stone claw was simply attached to the arm of the throne by a small, nearly invisible hinge. Curious, she lifted the claw. A low, grating sound rumbled through the chamber. Dale gave a small cry as the throne lurched beneath her. All watched in astonishment as the entire dais slid to one side, revealing a spiral staircase leading down into darkness. I knew that would happen, Dale lied with a crooked grin. The song-like trilling in Kern's mind was strong. They were close to the hammer, very close. I recognize this place. Miltiades spoke softly as the five moved stealthily down the dim passageway. We are near the cavern where Flan was imprisoned by the Red Wizard years ago. 
The passageway bent sharply to the left. Suddenly, the ceilings and walls dropped away. The group found themselves standing at the head of a flight of stairs, gazing out over a cavern, bathed in a crimson glow. Tire, have mercy, Kern whispered. The vast cavern was filled with undead. Corpses in every imaginable state of decay writhed below, as if performing some horrible mockery of a ballroom dance. So numerous were the refugees from the grave that Kern couldn't even spot the floor. Withered mummies covered with parchment-dry skin, bloated zombies dragging slimy entrails, and skeletal beasts bearing feral fangs dotted the throng. Loose skulls rolled around the floor, nipping at heels, while severed arms scuttled through the crowd, trying to attach themselves to other undead beings. These were the denizens of the coffin walls, Kern realized. He gripped his enchanted war hammer. I want to thank you all for coming this far with me, he said to the others, his green eyes solemn. You're not thinking of going down there, Kern, Listel said with a horrified expression. I know you've had some dumb ideas before, but next to this, an ogre looks like a genius. Kern swallowed his misgivings. I have to go ahead, Listel. It's my destiny. But all of you can head back to the surface. There must be an exit other than through the throne room. No, Paladin, Serana laid a hand on his arm. I made a promise to you. I intend to keep it. I, too, will stay at your side, Kern, Miltiades murmured in his sepulchral voice. It was for this mission that Tyre raised me once again from the grave. It is my duty. Dale shot Listel a fey grin. I don't want to be the only one missing out on all the fun, she told the elf. Listel rolled her eyes in vexation. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but she sighed deeply. Count me in, you ogre-brained oaf. Thank you, Kern said gruffly. The five started down the stairwell. The undead mob jabbered exultantly. Kern raised his war hammer as they descended. Suddenly, he was no longer afraid of his destiny, no longer afraid of failure. All that mattered was that he try his best. As the animated corpses surged forward, Kern whispered a brief prayer to Tyre. Suddenly, the undead and the four stumbled backward, shrieking in agony. A dozen of them crumbled into fine yellow dust. Kern, look at your shield, Listel cried. The plain shield of beaten steel that Miltiades had given him was now glowing with a holy light. Miltiades laughed, a strange sound echoing inside his armor. Yes, Kern, that's it. Open yourself to Tyre's power. You've taken the first step down the path toward being a paladin. The minions of evil will not dare stand before you. Miltiades' own shield erupted in azure light, adding its strength to Kern's. The triumphant cacophony of the undead quickly changed into shrieks of terror. They fought past each other to get away from the searing light. Those caught in its radiant beams burst apart into clouds of bone dust. Shields before them, Kern and Miltiades cut a wide swath through the cavern, Listel, Dale, and Serana following closely behind. The undead howled in fury, but none dared to approach the holy ward surrounding Miltiades and Kern. Suddenly, the vast archway of the nave loomed before the adventurers. Well, Matt, hammer seeker, a vast and terrible intellect announced from the darkness. Have you come to bow to me before you face your doom? Show yourself, Kern called out. As you wish, the creature crooned wickedly. 
The shadow swirled and parted. Something stepped into the light. An Ocelot, Serana hissed. A fiend from the Nine Hells, but like none I have ever seen. The others could not take their eyes from the creature that towered over them. Grub white skin was pulled tautly over the Ocelot's bony, human-like limbs. Pinprick eyes burned hotly in its skull mask face. Behind the ocelot lashed a curved, many-jointed tail, ending in a barbed tip oozing a thick yellow fluid. In the half-light, Kern caught a glimpse of what looked like a fine silver chain attached to the creature's abdomen, stretching back into the darkness of the nave. Your doom is upon you, yuggling. The ocelot spat venomously. There was no time to react as the monstrous creature raised a spidery hand and hurled a sphere of shadow. The orb struck the adventurers, bursting into a thousand pieces of ebony. Kern blinked and saw that his armor was covered with a fine dusting of blue cobwebs. His unmagic had counteracted the ocelot's spell. But the others had not been so fortunate. Listel, Dale, Serana, and Miltiades all stood perfectly motionless, frozen in mid-action. They were not the only ones. The entire cavern had fallen into silence. The throng of undead was frozen as well. Kern was the only one moving in the deathly quiet cavern, except for the Ocelot. So, you dare to resist my magic, do you, youngling? The creature scuttled forward, raising a huge, cruelly tipped spear. That is of little moment to me. It will be all the more satisfying to eat your living flesh. It thrust the spear downward. Kern barely had time to deflect the blow with a swing of his warhammer. The two weapons clashed in a spray of sparks. Hammer Seeker and Hammer Warder circled each other. The Ocelot lunged again, but Kern blocked the blow with his glowing shield. You are skilled in battle, thief, the Ocelot hissed. Why do you call me that? Kern cried, swinging his war hammer. The fiend scuttled out of the hammer's reach. Because that is what you are. The ocelot's mental message brimmed with loathing. You have come to steal that which is not rightfully yours. The hammer belongs to Tyre, Kern shouted angrily, ducking the creature's spear. That is not true, younglings. Eons ago, Tyre stole the hammer from my master, Bane. It was Bane who forged it. The hammer does not belong to your accursed god. You lie, Kern shouted. He swung his warhammer wildly, but the blow went wide. No, youngling, I do not. You know in your heart that I speak the truth. Kern shook his head dizzily. The ocelot was lying. It had to be lying. Doubt flickering in Kern's heart. The same moment the light emanating from his shield wavered, dimmed, then went out. With a cry of rage, Kern dropped the shield and gripped his hammer with both hands. You lie, fiend, he screamed. Fiercely, he swung his hammer at the ocelot, but his footing was not secure. He slid across a scattering of platinum coins and tumbled to the floor, the hammer skittering away from his hands. It was just like the nightmare. Howling with laughter, the ocelot rushed forward. The creature raised its spear for a death blow. And now, hammer seeker, you will seek no more. Something thin and silver glimmered as the ocelot moved the chain dangling from the fiend's body. Only it wasn't really a chain. Kern saw now as the creature loomed over him. It was more like a thread stretching back into the darkness. A realization struck him. This, too, had been part of the nightmare. 
In a heartbeat, Kern knew what he had to do. In desperation, he snaked out an arm, fingers stretching toward the hammer. Even as the ocelot thrust its spear downward, Kern pulled himself to his knees and swung the hammer at the silver thread. There was a brilliant, sizzling flash. The ocelot screamed, dropping its spear. The enchanted hammer shattered in Kern's grip. The shards of silver and steel flew in all directions. Kern was momentarily blinded, but when his vision cleared, his heart sank. The blow had not severed the ocelot's silvery thread. Kern could see now that the thread was attached to a huge web stretching across the back of the nave. The web must be the source of the ocelot's power. That was the secret the creature had unwittingly revealed in the nightmare. Bound in the center of the web was a metallic cross-shaped object, obscured by sticky threads. Kern had no doubt of what it was. The hammer of Tyre. The ocelot chortled evilly. This grows sweeter and sweeter, youngling. Its breath was fetid with the scent of death. It would be sweeter yet to crush you with the hammer you have so foolishly sought. Would that I dared to wield it. In its gloating, the ocelot did not realize its mistake. Doesn't dare to touch the hammer, Kern realized. If Bane truly forged the hammer, why would Bane's servant fear to use it? He knew the answer. The ocelot had lied. The hammer was tires. The ocelot flicked its tail, bringing the barbed stinger close to Kern's throat. Venom glistened on its tip. A memory flickered through Kern's mind. For a split second, he was in Flan once again, sitting with Tarl and Listel by the fire in Dinlor's tower. His father was telling a story, a story about the hammer. And... No matter how far I threw it, it always returned to my hand when I called it. At last! Victory is mine! The ocelot shrieked. Kern closed his eyes. He knew he had just one chance. Come to me, he called out in his mind. Come! With a rending sound, the hammer of Tyre wrenched itself from the center of the web. Shining brightly, it flew through the air directly into Kern's outstretched hand. He didn't hesitate. Even as the ocelot stinger descended, Kern hurled the hammer with all his might back toward the web. Awakened by the touch of one faithful to Tyre, the hammer burned with fury, striking the web that had imprisoned it moments before, burning it to ashes. No! The ocelot screamed in terror. This cannot be! Holy blue fire snaked along the thread toward the ocelot, engulfing it. The creature writhed in agony. Kern summoned the hammer back to his hand. It felt comfortable and right in his grip. It's time you joined your master, Bane, Kern said between clenched teeth. He swung the hammer of Tyre. It struck the ocelot full in the chest. With a thunderclap, the fiend burst apart in a spray of bone splinters and shreds of dry, parchment-like skin. Kern's nightmares had come to an end. The sun sank into a sea of molten bronze clouds behind the jagged stump of the Red Tower. Kern sat, exhausted, on a granite boulder, the others around him. The enchantment paralyzing them had vanished when the ocelot died, as had the dark magic animating the horde of undead that filled the cavern and the rest of the Red Tower. All had collapsed into dust when the web was destroyed. Listel grinned at Kern. You know, that wasn't half bad. For an ogre-brained oaf, that is. You do him a disservice, illusionist, Serana chided gently. 
she laughed a sound like golden bells. You are truly a hero, Kern. Do you think I could hold Tyre's hammer? Her dark eyes glowed. I doubt I will ever be this close to a holy relic again. It would mean a great deal to me. Of course, Serana, Kern said. I could never have gained the hammer without you. He took the ornate weapon from his belt. In the fading sunlight, fine runes glowed on its flawless steel surface. Suspicion flared in Listel's heart. Kern, don't do it, she shouted. Too late. He held out the hammer. Without hesitating, Serana snatched it up with a triumphant expression. At last, it is mine, she cried exultantly. Kern stared at her in astonishment. Suddenly, an expression of agony twisted Serana's face. She screamed in pain, dropping the hammer. By all the blackest gods, it burns. Kern and the others watched in horror as Serana's lovely coppery skin began to bubble and smoke. Two stumps sprouted from her back, unfurling into vulture-like wings covered with oily black feathers. In moments, the beautiful wild mage was gone. In her place stood a creature that was formed only vaguely like a woman. Her body and face were hideously misshapen. Dagger-shaped fangs curved down from her crooked maw, and sharp talons sprouted from her gnarled fingers. Her wings beat furiously, casting off a foul odor. A foul Erenyes, Miltiadi spoke grimly, raising his sword. Oh, vile paladin, don't you find my true form lovely? The Arenya Serana rasped in a croaky voice. If not, you may blame it on my human father, the red wizard Marcus. Human and fiendish blood do not mix well, but I care nothing for beauty. I can don it like a cloak or cast it aside when I need it no longer. It is power that matters to me. Like the power of Tyre's hammer, Kern said, shaking his head in wonderment. He knelt to retrieve the relic from the ground where it had fallen. The Arrhenius whirled on him. Yes, she hissed. I will have it, you foolish little puppy, just as I will have revenge upon you and all of Flan as well. She turned her murderous gaze toward Miltiades. You will pay for slaying my father. You all will pay. But you have failed, Serana, Listel said, her voice hard. Think that if you wish, elf, the Arrhenius snarled. But I have a source of power which I have barely begun to tap. You will never defeat the magic of the Pool of Twilight. Never. The half-fiend began to back away from the others. Vengeance will be mine! Don't let her escape, Dale cried. She raised her bow, but before she could loose an arrow, the Arrhenias gripped the bone amulet at her throat. In a puff of smoke, she vanished. Dale's arrow passed through thin air. Serana was gone. Chapter 13 Vows of Vengeance Patriarch Anton watched intently as Sister Sindara, augur of the Temple of Tyre, let the runestone slip through her fine-boned fingers. The time-worn pebbles, each carved with a holy symbol, tumbled onto a round silver plate. The wizened priestess peered at the stones, studying the pattern they made as they fell. What do you see in the temple's future, Sister Sandara? Anton asked softly. The two were alone in a small, candlelit antechamber off the temple's main hall. A moment, Anton, 
Sindara scolded. Fate cannot be rushed. Anton smiled at this gentle rebuke. Of all the clerics left in Flan's Temple of Tyre, only Sindara was older than he was, and only she spoke to him in such a familiar manner. If sometimes she was not as respectful to the patriarch as custom dictated, Anton took no offense. After all, Sendara had been a full cleric of the faith when he could only do little more than coo and slumber in his mother's arms. These are ill tidings, she said finally in a cracked voice. What is it? Anton glowered at the stones scattered across the silver platter. They meant nothing to his untrained eyes. A shadow approaches the Temple of Tyre. Sindara's dark eyes were like bright chips of obsidian. A foe who has attacked us once before gathers together even greater strength. Soon we will be awash in a sea of darkness. Are you certain? The ancient priestess frowned at Anton, hands on the hips of her soft gray robe. It's not as if I'm making this up for dramatic effect, you know. Anton sighed deeply, placing his hands on her thin shoulders. I know, Sindara, I know. It is difficult news to bear, that's all. As will be the dark days to come, Sindara extricated herself from his grasp. But there is more, Anton, and on this the runes speak clearly. She gazed at the scattered stones again. Flan has suffered many foes and many battles in its history, but none have ever been so dire or so important as this. We must prevail in our coming trials, or all will be lost. What do you mean, Sindara? I mean, Anton she said somberly, that if the temple of Tyre falls before the hammer is returned, then all of Flan is doomed. Forever. She gathered her rune stones and slipped them into a small silken pouch, leaving Anton alone in the antechamber to contemplate her words. A chill had settled in the old patriarch's bones, but he didn't know if it was from the wintry air or Sindara's frightening words. He found himself wondering once again how Kern and the others were faring on their quest for Tyre's hammer. A thought struck him. He left the antechamber, making his way through the temple's upper corridors. It was after Vespers, and the candles had been lit against the gathering gloom outside. He knocked on a small wooden door and entered a room, finding Tarl de Sania sitting in a stiff-backed chair. His stricken wife lay before him. Tarl had moved her from their tower to the sanctuary of the temple several days before. Anton could hear her breathing, painfully slow in its rhythm. It's dark in here, the patriarch rumbled softly, lighting a candle. Tarl shrugged his massive shoulders. It isn't as if either shall or I care. Anton winced. Sometimes he forgot that Tarl was blind. You didn't come to evening prayers. Anton sat in a chair next to his friend. I said my prayers here, Tarl answered. His voice was flat and toneless, but Anton caught the bitterness in it. Anton took a deep breath. Have you received any sign that might tell you how the hammer seeker fares, Brother Tarl? Any word from Tyre? Tarl's blind eyes seemed to gaze out the darkened window. Nothing. I have felt nothing. After a moment's hesitation, Anton decided to tell Tarl his reason for asking. He recounted the augury that Sister Sandara had just prescribed. If the temple fell, Flan would be lost. Tarl turned his sightless eyes toward Anton. Flan will be lost? His haggard voice was almost mocking. 
If Kern does not return, Anton, my family will be lost. If Kern perishes, then so will Shal. I will have no one. He hung his head at a loss for more words. Anton's shaggy eyebrows knitted into a scowl. Lately, Tarl had been sinking into a black despair, but Anton had not realized how hopeless the cleric's attitude was until now. This could not go on. There are others besides you and your loved ones to think of, cleric of Tyre, Anton said sternly. Regardless of whether the hammer seeker succeeds or fails, the temple must stand. All of us must be ready to fight the coming battle. Really? Tarl asked hoarsely. And how does a blind cleric fight, Anton? Shall I have good brother Dameron point me toward the enemy and kindly tell me when to start swinging? He shook his head fiercely. No. I wish you luck in your battle, Anton, but my own battle is here. He reached out a hand to smooth Shal's fiery hair from her pallid brow. Anton rose from his chair, suddenly angry. Do not speak to me of your private battles, Tarl. I have watched as one by one our brothers and sisters have been struck down by the scourges sent by the gods of evil, the enemies of Tyre. I have watched as foul disease rotted their bodies in the space of an hour, and as searing flames consumed them in an agonizing minute, all because the temple's aura could no longer protect them. Anton clenched his big hands into a fist. The day you survived the scourge sent against you, Tarl, I was filled with joy. It gave me hope that the temple could withstand the evil with which the gods of darkness afflict Flan. But now I see I was wrong. He paused by the door, his face grim. We have lost you after all, Brother Tarl. The patriarch left, shutting the door behind him. Tarl clenched his hands into fists. Who was Anton to speak to him so, as if he were simply some sulky acolyte feeling sorry for himself? Why couldn't he see that there was nothing Tarl could do to help the temple, let alone his wife and son? But gradually, the rage ebbed in Tarl's heart. A remembered voice echoed in his mind. Never forget, husband. You are the same man you always were. Shall. She would have agreed with Anton, Tarl knew. But her words seemed so distant now, so hollow. I am different, Shal. He whispered to her sleeping form, reaching out a hand to grip hers tightly. And I will never be the same again. In a distant chamber high in the temple, Sister Sindara reached down and removed one of the thirteen rune stones scattered on the table before her, slipping it into a black velvet pouch. Now only a dozen remained, leaving the pattern incomplete. We are doomed she whispered to the night. She blew out the lone candle, but there would be no sleep for her that night. Deep beneath the dragonspine mountains, a howl of sublime fury echoed off the cavern's glistening limestone stalactites. A hideously malformed creature hobbled on clawed feet to the edge of the pool of twilight, Greasy black wings flapping feebly in useless agitation. Magical energy still surrounded the creature, the residue of the powerful spell that had, in the space of a heartbeat, carried her to this place. I had it, Serana screeched. The hammer of Tyre, I held it in my hands. She lifted her arms and gazed at the burnt, horribly twisted claws that had been delicate hands only moments earlier. 
Another shriek of rage escaped her lopsided mouth, rattling the very foundation of the mountains. Something stirred beneath the pool's dull metallic waters. You should have known the holy power of Tyre's hammer would reject the touch of evil. A voice bubbled up from the murky depths. Why did you not see fit to share this valuable information with me? The half Erinya's wizard ranted. You did not deign to ask me, sorceress. You wretched worm. Do you dare mock me? She raised a gnarled claw, ready to fling a bolt of magic to the cavern's ceiling and send a rain of razor-sharp stalactites plunging into the pool. Never would I mock you, sorceress, the guardian of the pool whined. Come, place your hands in my waters. I will take your pain away. Momentarily placated, Serana knelt by the edge of the pool and slipped her hands into the viscous water. Suddenly, dozens of glowing flecks appeared, swirling about her wrists like miniature stars. She gasped, feeling a strange tingling in her fingers. She jerked her hands out of the pool. What have you done to my... She began suspiciously. Suddenly she halted, entranced. Her hands, they were whole again. The pain caused by the hammer of Tyre had vanished. In wonderment, Serana flexed her fingers. They were smooth and shapely, ending in delicately curved nails as dark and hard-edged as obsidian. Yet the rest of her was as hideous as ever. She could use magic to cloak herself with the disguise of beauty, but that could never change the misbegotten form that was her natural condition. Yet the pool could. Ah, how glorious it would be to be truly beautiful, just like her mother had been. I cannot, sorceress, unless... Of course, you are willing to submerge yourself in the pool. For a fleeting moment, Serana was tempted. But only for a moment. She laughed, a sound filled with hot loathing and contempt. A clever trick, beast, but not clever enough. She stood, eyes blazing. I told you that I will not free you until you have granted me the power I need to destroy Flan. Magic crackled away from her in every direction. Smoking chunks of rock fell from the cavern's roof, exploding like bombs as they struck the pool. Its waters roiled turbulently as the guardian writhed beneath. Now I demand that you give me more power, beast. Power enough to destroy Flan once and for all. As you wish, great sorceress, the guardian sniveled. Drink, drink, and the power shall be yours. A silver chalice rose out of the pool and hovered before Serana. She grasped it with her newly restored hands. Once before she had drunk but a mere drop of the twilight pool's waters, and had gained fantastic power, enough to summon a dream stalker from a distant world. What would be the effect of drinking an entire chalice of the liquid? She gazed at the metallic fluid within the cup, hesitating. Brilliant flecks of light swirled beneath its surface. I must have the might to destroy Flan, she whispered. Her hesitation faded. She raised the chalice to her lips and drained its thick, oily contents in a single draft. The chalice clattered to the hard stone and rolled away. Serana reeled, her heart pounding furiously. Magical energy like she had never before imagined surged through her veins. It buoyed her, 
lifting her so that her feet hardly touched the ground. She raised her arms in exultation, feeling the soft fabric of shadows sift through her fingers. Understanding rippled through her mind. One drop of the pool had granted her the ability to see all the myriad shades of darkness that existed in a single shadow. But now she could cup that darkness in her hands, mold it, shape its form, and breathe evil life into it. Yes, sorceress, the guardian of the pool whispered in her mind. You can forge shadow images of any creature you desire, and they will serve you with all the powers of twilight. I shall create an army, she cried, gathering the stuff of shadows about her, draping it around her deformed body. An army of shadows! She wasted no time. With her hands and mind, she began to mold the darkness into a fearsome form. She gave it long, muscular arms and serrated fangs in a jackal-shaped snout. Last, she fashioned a sinuous tail ending in razor-sharp spikes. She stood back and admired her handiwork. Now this was a fiend like none that had ever dwelled in the Nine Hells. A fiend born of shadow, whose only purpose was to serve Serana. It bowed to her, and she clapped her hands in evil delight. Then she reached out, gathering more darkness to create another shadow fiend. Suddenly she froze. She felt a strange, prickling sensation, as if sensing the touch of a distant, roving eye. It lasted only for a second, then was gone. Serana shivered. What was that? she demanded of the guardian. An enemy journeys through the mountains, seeking the pool. What? Serana snarled in outrage. Show me. The surface of the pool swirled. An image appeared, showing a stream tumbling through a narrow mountain valley. A woman with long, chestnut-colored hair picked her way among the rocks, a large, tawny cat padding behind her. Numerous pouches hung at the woman's belt. Evane! Serana recognized the sorceress from their earlier meeting. The sorceress hunts pools like an owl hunts mice. She would destroy the pool of twilight, mistress. I have felt her magical detections reaching out for me once before. I thought I had dealt her a blow strong enough to annihilate her. Apparently you failed, Serana observed venomously. She paced beside the pool's edge. I shall simply have to deal with this meddlesome sorceress myself. A cruel smile curled about her misshapen lips. And I think I know just the way. She closed her eyes, sending forth a summons. Come to me, dream stalker. Come and heed your leader's call. There was a hiss of dank, musty air. Ragged tatters of shadow began to swirl in front of Serana. The half Arrhenius plunged her hand into the mist of the shadow, her fingers closing around a dark, slender strand. With all her might, she pulled on the thread. The vortex of shadow exploded, and the ethereal form of the Bastilus materialized before Serana. What do you wish of me, mistress? The dream stalker intoned in its somnolent voice. This woman is my enemy, Serana snapped, gesturing toward the image in the pool. I want you to feed upon her dreams. Feed until every last shred of her sanity has been consumed. Do you understand? The Bastila's sigh nodded. It could sense the power of the long-haired woman in the image reflected in the pool. Draining her spirit through her dreams would be satisfying indeed. With a grateful bow, Sai melted into the air. Serana smirked. 
try to destroy my pool, will she? She ran a slender finger under the jutting chin of the shadow fiend she had just created, then threw her head back and laughed. Like tiny stars, faint sparks of light began to swirl beneath her skin, glowing the exact same color as the shining flecks of twilight in her eyes. While Serana gloated over her plans, reveling in her new abilities, the guardians sank to the bottom of the twilight pool. The creature was well pleased. The half Arrhenes was becoming more and more ensnared by the magic of the pool. The guardian had been only too glad to grant her another drink of the pool's waters. Each taste would only make her hunger for more, and no matter how much the creature gave her, it would never be enough to satisfy her abominable cravings. It was only a matter of time before she succumbed to the temptation to submerge herself in the pool, to embrace its vast power. The moment she did, the guardian would be free, and the insufferable half-fiend would find herself imprisoned within the pool as its new guardian. The creature writhed in the murky depths, sending bubbles floating sluggishly upward through the thick metallic water. Ah, how glorious to fly again! What havoc the creature would be able to wreak once free of the blasted pool! Serana thought she had cause for vengeance against Flan, but her hatred was nothing compared to the creature's own. Its loathing of that damnable city had grown during the centuries of entrapment. Its strength had grown as well during those long, agonizing years. Once free, the creature's power would be nearly as limitless as its hatred. And then Flan would pay for its past transgressions. Soon. Dusk, the guardian murmured to itself. Very, very soon. It had to be patient, but there was not much longer to wait. Kern had always thought that the day he regained the Hammer of Tyre would be a day of unparalleled joy, but despite the solid weight of the ancient relic resting at his hip, he didn't feel much like celebrating. They had gathered in the Aspen Grove at dawn to bid their last farewells to Wren. The first steely beams of light slanted between the ghostly trees, sparkling as they fell upon the fine dusting of new snow that mantled the ground. The winter air was cold, the wind perfectly still. It was almost as if the whole world were holding its breath. Dale stood beside her father's body gazing at the two magical daggers she held in her hands, right and left. Use your father's weapons well, Dale, Miltiades said solemnly. You are Dale of the Blade now. No, she said softly, shaking her head. She looked up, her blue eyes cold as ice. These daggers protected me beneath the Red Tower, but I could never wield them like my father. No one could. They are his and no others. Dale knelt and slipped the two blades into their sheaths in Wren's boots. Then she stood straight, unslinging her ashwood bow from her shoulder. She drew a red feathered arrow from the quiver on her back and pulled back against the bowstring, aiming for the sky. With a cry, she released the arrow. It sped high into the slate-blue dome above. The arrow traveled upward until Kern lost sight of it. Suddenly, the two daggers tucked into Rin's boots quivered. Each gave a small jerk as the knobs on the end of their hilts popped open. Two small, smooth stones rose out of the compartments concealed in the dagger hilts to whirl about Dale's head. The others stared in wonder. 
Miltiades recognized the small stones. They are Ren's iron stones. Dale nodded. She knew the story behind the stones. They had been stolen by a woman named Tempest, a thief. Tempest had been Ren's first love, but she was murdered by the Lord of the Ruins, the dragon who had sought to control the pool of radiance in the ruins thirty years earlier. The two iron stones settled onto Dale's bow and embedded themselves in the wood with a faint click. The longbow hummed brightly in the ranger's grip. Then was quiescent once again. Dale nodded in understanding. The magical stones were her father's last gift to her. She lowered her bow, her shoulders stiff and square. From now on, I am Dale Red Fletching, she said grimly. The others nodded dumbly, alarmed at the ferocity in the young ranger's voice and the coldness in her eyes. Without a word, Dale turned to make her way back to the campfire. The companions ate a cheerless breakfast of dried fruit and flatbread by the scant warmth of the fire. Miltiades, who had no use for food, instead drew a small brooch from a leather purse. The brooch was wrought of gold and set with a single clear gemstone. Evain gave it to me, he explained to the others, so that we might communicate with each other. I think she would care to know that you have gained the hammer, Kern, as well as the sorrowful news about Wren. The skeletal paladin whispered the word of magic Yvain had taught him that activated the brooch. The crystal flashed, and an image appeared within its facets. The image showed a snowy, wind-scoured crag rising high above a range of jagged peaks. There was no sign of Yvain anywhere. Where is she? Kern asked with a frown. Miltiades shook his head. I do not know. If she still possessed the brooch, she would know I am calling her. She must have lost it, Listel said worriedly. But where? Unless mountains have a habit of growing overnight, I don't think that's the forest around her dwelling. Those are the Dragon Spine Mountains, Dale said, peering into the gym. I recognize them from the map that Yvain created with my father's help. Miltiades uttered another magical word. The gym went dark. This can only mean one thing. Yvain has journeyed into the mountains. But why? Kern asked. Listel's eyes widened in realization. Don't you see? She intends to destroy the Pool of Twilight. Ridding Ferran of the pools is her life's quest. The elf swore sharply. We should have known she would try something like this. Well, maybe Yvain knows what she's doing, Kern offered. After all, I don't think there's anyone who knows more about pools within a thousand leagues of here. That is true, Kern, Miltiades replied. But no matter how wise Yvain may be, she cannot realize that Serana is drawing power from the pool. I doubt she expects to face another sorceress, let alone a half-fiend mage who is in league with the magic of the Twilight Pool. The skeletal knight's breastplate shuddered. Kern would almost have thought it a sigh if Miltiades had been in the habit of breathing. Then we have to go after her, to warn her. Kern stood. Miltiades raised a gauntlet, halting him. You forget, Kern. The Dragonspine Mountains are nearly a ten days ride from this place. With her scrying spells, Yvain will certainly discover the pool before we reach her, no matter how hard we ride. Indeed. She may have already located it. Kern hung his head in despair. 
We have to warn her somehow, he said without much confidence. I think I might be able to arrange something, Listel said, hurrying over to her leather backpack. I found these yesterday while I was wandering around the maze in the ruins. Something told me they might come in handy. She pulled two cylindrical objects from her pack. With a flick of her wrist, she unrolled one of them. It was a bright, intricately patterned carpet. Kern eyed the carpet skeptically. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I fail to see how a rug is going to solve our problems. Listel snorted with annoyance. Sometimes you have absolutely no imagination, Kern. She snapped her fingers, and abruptly the carpet rose several feet off the ground, its golden fringe fluttering. These are flying carpets. Listel hopped onto the hovering carpet while the others watched in amazement. The elf positively beamed. What in the world would you do without my help? I shudder to think, Miltiadi said, a note in his dry voice that might almost have been amusement. Their decision was made easy for them. While Kern wanted nothing more than to hurry back to Shal and Tarl, he knew they must go to warn Yvain. I suppose this means we'll have to leave you behind, Listel said sadly, stroking the muzzle of her gray pony. I don't think you need bid your steed farewell, Listel, Miltiades said. I wish you were right, Miltiades, Listel answered glumly, but somehow I doubt the horses will fit on the magic carpets. We'll see, Miltiades replied mysteriously. The undead paladin whispered something into the ear of his magical white stallion, Eratophanes, who then pranced toward Listel's pony. Eratophanes bent his head over the dappled gray and snorted. A pale mist encircled the pony, and suddenly the horse shimmered, shrinking in size until it became a tiny gray figurine standing in the snow. Eratophanes moved to the other horses, and in moments, they too had been transformed by the stallion's magical breath into miniatures. Eratophanes let out a whinny, then also glowed brightly, shrinking into a small, prancing figure. Miltiades gathered the miniature horses and placed them safely in a pouch. Kern could only shake his head and wonder. That was another problem solved. Now, if I could only do that with Kern when he's acting uncooperative, Listel mused. You know, Listel, you're really not as funny as you think you are, Kern grumped. She gave him a flat stare. What makes you think I'm joking? Quickly, they broke camp and packed their things onto the carpets. But when it was time to go, Dale hesitated. I'm sorry, Kern, she said quietly, but I can't go with you. At least not yet. I... I have to take my father back to the Valley of the Falls. I know he would want to lie by my mother's side. Kern nodded gravely, gripping her shoulder tightly. He hated to part company with the ranger. Take one of the carpets, Dale, Listel offered. We three can all fit on one. She shot Kern a wry look. If this big oaf doesn't hog all the space, that is. Kern nodded. Do take it, Dale, and when you can, come find us in the mountains. I will, Kern, I promise. With that, Kern, Miltiades, and Listel climbed onto one of the undulating carpets. At a signal from the elf, it rose into the air and sped northward. Dale watched as the carpet dwindled to a speck, then vanished from sight. A frigid wind picked up blowing her red-gold hair from her brow as she turned to face the dawning sun. I swear that I will avenge you, father, she whispered. Her words were snatched away by the wind. With the sky as my witness, I swear it. Dale, red-fletching, turned her back on the brilliant orb of the sun, and taking the second flying carpet, trudged up the slope toward the grove of aspens. Chapter 14 Curious Encounters
I don't know what's getting into me, Gam. Evane dragged herself out of her bedroll, blinking blearily in the brilliant morning light. This was the third day in a row she had woken, feeling as if she had been up, fighting battles all night long. Her dark eyes looked sunken, her skin sallow. She sighed as she sat cross-legged on her bedroll, slowly chewing a piece of hardtack. Even eating seemed a chore. You push yourself too hard, Evane, Gamaliel's voice entered her mind. And though you do not admit it, the cold bothers you. I don't mind it, Evane countered. But in the same instant, she gave a shiver, belying her words. The mountain cold seemed to seep right through her heavy coat and into her bones. You never were a very good liar, Gamaliel noted. Then I guess I'll just have to practice some more, won't I? Yvain replied archly. The great cat's whiskers twitched in annoyance. The sorceress sat aside the hardtack. She knew she had to eat to keep up her strength, but she had little appetite. She gathered her willpower and stood trembling as she gained her feet. Stiffly, she gathered her things and shrugged on her backpack. Let's go, Gam. She started off through the snow, followed by her familiar. Yvain was certain they were nearing the pool of twilight. She had cast her scrying spell several times these last few days, at several different locations. After each try, she had taken out her magical map of the mountains, and with a shining green line, marked the general direction of the spell. The pool was most likely concealed where the lines intersected. It was only a matter of time, and spells, before Yvain pinpointed the location exactly. She could only hope that when she finally did it, she would still have enough strength to destroy the pool of twilight. She found herself wondering how Miltiades and the others were faring. Reflexively, she reached up to touch the brooch of communication, but her fingers met only a small tear in her tunic. The brooch was gone. She sighed. How she had lost the gem she did not know. Now there was no way for her to contact the others. By midday, the forest had thinned, giving way to a field of boulders that sloped toward a sheer cliff. Climbing the cliff with its crumbling overhangs looked to be an impossibility. However, a small stream had cut a steep but passable ravine into the cliff face picking their way carefully across the loose scree. Sorceress and cat started up the defile. Yvain quickly realized they were not the first travelers to have come this way. Indeed, they stumbled upon a faint but distinguishable path, marked here and there by small cairns. When the ravine widened into a broad, boulder-strewn bowl, Yvain saw the remains of a temple, perched on the cliff top, now perhaps two hundred feet above them. It looked as if half of the structure had slid into the valley centuries ago, and what remained was wind-worn and roofless. But several colonnades of broken columns still stood, and a section of crumbling wall suggested some sort of nave. Yvain marveled at the ruin, wondering who had built a hall for their god in this place so long ago. It must have been a very holy sight, she thought. Even now, there was a peculiar serenity about the weathered columns that reached toward the azure dome of the sky. The path continues up to the temple, Gamaliel spoke in his mistress's mind. Yvain nodded and the two began to wind their way among the jagged boulders up the narrow path. Do you hear thunder? she asked her familiar, frowning. Winter is not the time for thunderstorms. Yvain gazed at the sky. There wasn't a cloud in sight. 
She was about to accredit the noise she had heard to her imagination, when suddenly she heard it again. It was louder this time, a low rumbling that grew with each passing second. Yvain, look out! The sorceress jerked her head up and gasped. A huge boulder bounced down the ravine toward the two travelers, pulverizing other rocks in its path. Gamaliel leaped toward her, knocking her aside. Entwined, the two rolled beneath a low granite overhang. A second later, the boulder struck the overhang and bounced past, missing Yvain and Gamaliel by a matter of inches. You didn't have to be quite so rough, Yvain said testily, wriggling out of the crevice and brushing herself off. A simple duck would have been sufficient. You're welcome, Yvain, Gamaliel replied wryly. This made her laugh despite their close call. She scratched him affectionately behind the ears, then started back up the path that followed the narrow gully. Moments later, another deep rumbling echoed down the ravine. They were better prepared for the boulder this time, scrambling out of its path before it hurtled by. But they had barely resumed their trek up the ravine when the booming noise began anew. This is getting ridiculous, Yvain said in growing annoyance, as the third boulder tumbled past the mouth of the shallow cave into which they had quickly scrambled. Once that boulder was out of sight, the sorceress found an ancient-looking cedar tree, gnarled and twisted by years of strong winds. She pulled herself up to its highest branches, which afforded a better view of the clifftop. What she saw made her stare in amazement. I think I've found the source of those boulders, she called down to Gamaliel. Even as she pointed, a huge man-shaped form lumbered mechanically from between the temple's colonnades. The creature carried a massive boulder in its arms, moving toward a crumbling wall that ended abruptly at the cliff's edge. When the gigantic creature reached the end of the wall, it dropped the rock and the fourth boulder started its noisy journey down the mountainside. Apparently, unperturbed, the creature lumbered back through the temple to pick up another boulder and begin the sequence anew. After watching this go on for a few minutes, Yvain scrambled down the tree. What is that creature, Yvain? Gamaliel's tail twitched in agitation. I think it's a stone golem. A golem? Yvain nodded. A creature made of some inert substance that has been magically animated. Wood, iron, clay, or, in this case, stone. She winced as another boulder bounced past them down the ravine. Which means that it's big, immeasurably strong, and almost completely impervious to injury. I don't suppose you know why it keeps on tossing boulders down the ravine. Yvain rubbed her narrow chin and thought. I don't really know, unless... Her eyes flashed. A golem is a mindless creature, Gam, she explained excitedly. Its creator can give it only the simplest instructions, and the golem will perform those instructions literally. It could be that, long ago, this golem's creator ordered it to keep the temple in good repair. But some disaster befell the temple. Half of the structure slid down the side of the cliff, and the rest was abandoned. But the stone golem continued to try to repair the temple. Right. Every time the golem puts a boulder where the wall used to be, the rock falls into the ravine but the golem isn't smart enough to realize what's happening. All it sees is that the wall needs another stone, so it tries to rebuild again and again. How long will the golem keep trying to rebuild that one wall? Wind ruffled the great cat's tawny fur. Unless it's destroyed? Forever. Yvain gazed up the ravine, which means... It's going to be hard for us to reach the top of the cliff. 
My guess is that it will take us about fifteen minutes to climb the last stretch of the ravine, but it only takes the golem a few minutes to find another boulder and drop it. She shook her head in frustration. There's no cover up there. We'd be crushed before we ever made it to the top. If only the golem would drop himself over the edge of the cliff, Gamaliel growled angrily. A vein snapped her fingers. Gam, that's it! She started picking her way up the ravine. Come on, we have to edge closer for my plan to work. The two continued up the defile, every few minutes hiding under overhangs or squeezing inside cracks to avoid the tossed boulders. When they reached the final section of the ravine, they could see its sheer sides offered little protection. Already the golem was lumbering toward the broken end of the wall, bearing yet another boulder. This will have to do, Yvain muttered. As the golem approached the precipice, she chanted the words of a spell. Suddenly a chunk of rock several feet wide quivered and liquefied into mud, sliding down into the ravine. Impervious to this change in its path, the golem lurched to the edge of the cliff. For a moment, the golem teetered on the precipice. Then, without the slightest resistance, it toppled over the edge. Golem and boulder went tumbling down the ravine in a spray of rock. Yvain grinned, watching the creature plummet into the valley. A simple idea, but it had worked. After you, Gam, she said. The two started toward the clifftop. Exhausted by the spell, Yvain could not move very fast. But there was less reason to hurry now that the golem was gone. They had made scant progress when a clattering of stone caused them to pause and gaze up. Yvain drew in a sharp breath of surprise. The stone golem was climbing up the ravine. The fall had not so much as scratched the creature. The golem moved with astonishing quickness, using its huge hands to help pull itself up. As quickly as she could manage, Yvain hurried up the rest of the slope. Gamaliel shimmered into his human shape, using his strong arms to help her. She heaved herself up over the cliff's edge, Gamaliel right behind her. The golem was mere seconds below. The sorceress tried to ready a spell, but fear seized her mind. She couldn't think clearly. Gamaliel shimmered into his cat form to defend her, ready to fight the golem. Yvain knew that would be folly. The magical creature had the strength to rip both of them to shreds. The stone golem reached the top, towering over Yvain and Gamaliel, blotting out the sun with its bulk. The creature raised its huge arms, lurching forward. Yvain shut her eyes, hoping the end would be quick. For a long moment, nothing happened. Finally, Gamaliel spoke in her mind. Yvain, open your eyes. Reluctantly, she did as he asked. What she saw made her gasp in astonishment, then laugh aloud. The stone golem went right past them, resuming its mindless task. Even now it was heading toward the crumbling wall, carrying another boulder. As Yvain watched, the golem reached the muddy cliff's edge, and without hesitating, toppled once again into the ravine. It will do that forever, won't it? Gamaliel asked. It will never learn, Yvain nodded but thankfully, we won't be around to watch it. Weakly, she pulled herself to her feet. Let's go, Gam. They started off through the ruined temple, leaving the golem to its ceaseless labor. We're coming down too fast, Kern shouted. I know, I know, Listel shouted back in annoyance as the flying carpet plunged toward the treetops. The updrafts are unpredictable this close to the mountains. It had taken only two days to cover the distance from the ruins of the Red Tower to the southern edge of the Dragonspine Mountains. 
but it looked to Kern as if their flying carpet days were about to come to an abrupt and violent end. The carpet caught a vortex of cold air, spinning wildly. Kern would have gone sailing off into the blue had it not been for the strong grip Miltiades had on his belt. An eagle wheeled past with a startled expression. Listel, I can see a meadow not far ahead, the skeletal paladin said calmly. The elf nodded. I'm aiming for it. The wind whipped Kern's hair wildly about. Here we go, Listel cried, pulling on the pair of tassels that helped her steer the carpet. Kern tightened his grip on the golden fringe. The treetops flew by mere inches below. He could see the meadow now, perhaps a quarter mile ahead. We're not going to make it, he yelled over the roar of the wind. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Listel snapped. She concentrated on keeping the magic carpet steady, just a little farther. Suddenly, a dead tree loomed before them, stretching its gnarled limbs higher than the surrounding foliage. Listel jerked hard on the tassels. There was a loud sound of rending cloth as a sharp branch punched through the fabric. The carpet's unraveling, Kern shouted as they plummeted toward the clearing. Sure enough, a thread from one end of the carpet had caught on the dead tree, and now the magical silk was unwinding behind them like a skein of yarn. The three had to crowd closer as the surface area of the flying carpet rapidly dwindled. Listel yanked even harder on the golden tassels. The carpet managed to stay aloft for only a few more seconds. Then the last of the thread ran out. Kern, Listel, and Miltiades fell through the air and landed a half second later on soft, dry, sweet smelling grass. Confused, Kern sat up, wondering why he hadn't been knocked dead by the fall. A glistening thread of silk settled slowly to the treetops, its end draped down over a dazed looking Listel. The carpet, Manage to bear our weight until we were only a few feet above the ground, Miltiades offered in answer to their bewildered looks. Listel sighed as she picked up one end of the silken thread. I think this is it for the magic carpet, she said glumly. Unless knitting also happens to be one of a paladin's special skills. I doubt it, Kern said with disdain. The three gathered their scattered possessions. With a few magical words, Miltiades restored their three horses to their natural form. Kern's palfrey and Listel's gray pranced and snorted excitedly, apparently no worse for the wear, for having been miniaturized. Eratosthenes, of course, was quite used to the experience. They rode across the dull-colored meadow toward the snow-topped mountains. Now that they were here, Kern wondered how they would ever find Yvain. He and Listel discussed their options. Dale had said the scene revealed by Miltiades' communication gem lay close to the center of the mountains, so that gave him a general direction. Once they were in the actual vicinity, Listel thought she could whip up some spells to help them locate the sorceress. Throughout this discussion, Miltiades had been quiet, but now the undead paladin spoke up. We will find her, he said confidently. I will know when she is near. However, just how he would know, he did not say. Listel and Kern exchanged a curious glance. The sun was sinking toward the western horizon when they reached the forest that blanketed the lower slopes. Deciding it would be best to camp among the shelter of the trees, they decided to press on a bit farther. They guided their mounts down a winding trail, past silent stands of fir and ghost-pale aspen. They had not gone far when sharp, ringing sounds broke the sylvan stillness. All three knew the familiar clangor of steel on steel, 
There was a battle going on not far ahead. Come on, Kern cried, urging his mount into a gallop. Kern, shouldn't we be a little more cautious? Listel called after him to no avail. Muttering a few choice words about his lack of common sense, she rode after him, Miltiades close behind. Moments later, they burst into a circular glade open to the slate-gray sky. Kern halted for a second, taking in the scene. A frail, old man was battling a huge, misshapen creature. Even as Kern watched, the old man's blade, a heavy antique broadsword, clashed loudly with the creature's spiked club. Somehow, the old man was managing to hold his own. He was wizened and ancient-looking, his flowing hair and beards as white as ivory. He wore no armor, only a simple robe of dove gray. Even at this distance, Kern could see his sharp blue eyes sparking like steel against a whetstone. The creature bellowed. With its massive ten-foot frame, warty hide, and blazing purple eyes, Kern guessed it to be an ogre. The monster raised its huge club for a crushing blow. Drawing the hammer of Tyre from his belt, Kern spurred his mount forward, thundering into the glade. Listel and Miltiades were not far behind. The ogre paused, looking up in dull-witted surprise. Then it snarled nastily, bearing jagged black fangs. It lurched forward, ready to engage its new enemies. Zaraxa! Listel cried out as she tossed a small ball of pitch mixed with bat fur at the monster. It exploded, and the creature roared, shaking its head as Listel's spell blinded it. The ogre swung its club wildly. Kern easily parried the blow. Upon striking his holy warhammer, the club splintered. Miltiades took advantage of the creature's confusion to deal a blow with his sword, cutting a gash in the ogre's side. Its howl of pain was short-lived. Kern swung his hammer in a glowing arc, striking the ogre full in the chest. The creature toppled and did not rise again. Quickly, Kern dismounted and hurried to the old man, who leaned on the hilt of his broadsword. Are you all right, sir? He inquired deferentially. The old man snorted in disgust. I was until you and your over-eager friends here showed up. Kern stared at him in astonishment. The old man's shaggy eyebrows bristled like gigantic snowy caterpillars. Fighting that rock-brained ogre was the most fun I'd had in months. He tapped a bony finger against Kern's breastplate. And then you had to come and spoil it all. I, I'm sorry. Kern sputtered, completely taken aback. I didn't know. Well, now you do, the old man grumbled, sheathing his rune-covered broadsword. He returned to retrieve a battered leathered pack from the ground. And I suppose now that you've ruined my sport, you'll be expecting to come share my fire and my supper as well. That way, you can be certain you'll spoil my day completely. Kern stared after the old man, entirely at a loss for words. The old man glared back. Well, are you coming, or aren't you? Without waiting for an answer, he started across the glade. Young people haven't a thimble full of sense these days, he muttered into his beard. Kern exchanged a puzzled look with Thistle and Miltiades then shrugged. There didn't seem to be much to do except to follow, so, leading his horse, he trailed along behind the stranger. Despite his thin and frail appearance, the old man proved fleet-footed. Soon Kern was huffing noisily, and even Listel seemed to be having a hard time keeping pace. The old man moved farther and farther ahead of them until he finally vanished among the trees. Kern exchanged a worried look with Listel, wondering if he had purposely lost them. The sky was growing purple with twilight 
when Kern caught sight of a warm, flickering glow between the trees. Moments later, he and the others stepped into a small clearing protected by the boughs of a huge fir tree. About time you showed up, the old man said testily. It seems young people are getting slower these days as well as duller. He sat by a cheerful fire, stirring something in a small iron pot. Whatever it was, it smelled wonderful. Kern's stomach growled, a noisy reminder that he hadn't eaten anything since the few bites of flatbread that had served as his rather inadequate breakfast. Well, sit down already, the old man gestured to a fallen log. Kern and Listel sat obediently. Miltiades remained standing, as was his custom eliciting a scowl from their host. Excuse me, sir, Kern finally blurted out as a steaming bowl of stew and a newly carved wooden spoon were shoved into his hands. But would you mind, um, that is, could I ask your name? You can call me Trooper, he replied, handing Listel a wooden bowl. I suppose it's as good a name as any I've been called, and no doubt better than some. Apparently, he thought this some sort of joke, for he broke into a long fit of cackling laughter. No, thank you, Miltiades' voice echoed inside his visor when Trooper offered him a bowl of stew. I do not require food. Trooper's bushy eyebrows knit together. No, I suppose you wouldn't. He shrugged and began eating his stew, blithely ignoring his company. Unsure what else to do, Kern swallowed a mouthful of stew, and for the next few minutes couldn't think of much else to say. Um, uh, by the way, Kern said finally, my name is Kern de Sania. And this is Listel on a portum, he gestured awkwardly toward the elf, who was busily shoveling food into her delicate elven face. Trooper grunted noncommittally, apparently none too impressed with this information. And our companion is Miltiades, Kern added, gesturing to the paladin. This name caused a flicker of interest in the old man's keen eyes. Miltiades? he said, setting down his bowl. Now, I'm getting on in years, but I would be a spring chicken a dozen times over compared to the paladin Miltiades. Tales tell he lived more than a thousand years ago. He shot a stern look in Kern's direction. You wouldn't be pulling my leg now, would you, son? He speaks the truth, Miltiades said, lifting his visor. The sight of the paladin's fleshless skull didn't raise so much as a shiver out of the old man. So he does, Trooper nodded. Greetings, Miltiades, from one warrior of Tyre to another. I see that the old fellow doesn't have the decency to let you enjoy the rest you've earned. Tyre has given me a quest I have yet to complete, Miltiades intoned solemnly. Trooper snorted, slapping his knee. Is that so? <laughs> well, Tyre had better not try to raise these old bones once they're settled, that's all I can say. I'll look him flat in the eye and tell him to bother someone else's skeleton. After they were through eating, Kern and Listel helped the old man clean the dishes. These are very nice, the elf remarked as she examined the spoons. Each was carved in a unique shape that followed the whorls and curves of the wood. Did you make these yourself? That I did, Trooper replied with more than a little pride in his voice. Just this morning, in fact. Suddenly, a frown crossed Listel's face. But how did you know to carve three of them? It's always a good idea to be prepared for company. Trooper snapped cantankerously, taking the spoons and stowing them away. 
as your presence here indicates, I might add. Listel didn't pursue the matter, but her curiosity was definitely piqued. We've come to look for someone in the mountains, Kern explained. She's a friend, he added. I should hope so, if you've come all this way just to look for her, <laughs> Trooper replied. He pulled out his rune sword and began polishing its edge with a bit of oilstone, carefully smoothing away small nicks and spots of rust. It was a beautiful weapon, with an intricately wrought handguard and strange carving all the way down the flat of the blade. Kern noticed at least one symbol that he recognized well, the scales of Tyre engraved on the sword's hilt. You're a paladin, aren't you? Listel rolled her silvery eyes. You mean you've only just now figured that out, Kern? She leaned toward Trooper, shielding her lips with a hand. It's only a theory, she whispered conspiratorially, but I think his skull's as dense as that hammer of his. Trooper winked at her. I'll keep that in mind, he whispered in a voice that was quite audible all around. Kern flushed in embarrassment, treating Listel to a withering look. She made a lame attempt to stifle her giggles. You fought well against that ogre today, Kern, Trooper said then. This compliment alleviated Kern's embarrassment a bit. Not that I needed your help, mind you, the old paladin was quick to add. Of course not, Kern hastily agreed. Trooper looked up at Miltiades. The lad has good command of that hammer, doesn't he? The undead paladin nodded in agreement. His father taught him well. Trooper grunted. Too bad he doesn't have such a good command of his heart. What? Kern asked. Trooper turned on him. Your heart, boy. Heart, you know, that thing that squeezes blood around inside your ribcage? He thumped his chest for emphasis. I know what a heart is, Kern said in exasperation. Well, I suppose that's something, Trooper said with a fierce grin. But do you know how to use it? Do you know how to make it your strongest weapon in battle? His grin faded. Ah, but I suppose you're not interested in anything an old man like me could teach you. Kern leaped to his feet, gripping his hammer. Show me, he said intently. Trooper laughed. That's more like it, lad. He stood, his broadsword gleaming in the firelight. Now, swing that hammer at me. Go on, don't be shy about it. Kern hesitated for a heartbeat, then swung. Trooper easily parried the blow with a swipe of his rune sword. Both weapons glowed with blue light as they met. No, lad, Trooper growled. You're swinging with your hands, not your heart. You can bash in a few orc skulls that way. But your arms may fail you when you're facing a foe that's stronger than you. Your heart is the only weapon you can count on in a crisis. He circled around the campfire, sword ready. Now, have a go at me again. Only this time, let your heart guide your hammer. Kern grunted as he brought the war hammer around. He tried to do as Trooper had instructed, but he wasn't quite sure what the old man meant. How could he guide the hammer with his heart? Blue fire flashed as the hammer bounced off Trooper's rune sword. No, lad, try again. Don't hit me with your weapon. Hit me with your courage, your spirit. Kern nodded, gritting his teeth. He tried to concentrate. Another swing, another flash of blue light. Gods, but he wanted to show Trooper what he was truly made of. Feel tires, power flowing through you, lad. Swing, flash, Kern grunted with effort. Fighting's more than having a good eye and a good arm. Swing, flash, Kern was swearing in rivulets. It's having faith, lad, faith that justice will overcome. 
For all his life, Kern would never forget that moment. It was like a dam breaking inside him. Sudden calm washed over him. Warmth flooded his chest. Instantly, he forgot about trying to impress Trooper with his skill or trying to prove his worth. None of that mattered anymore. He felt strangely buoyant. He could hardly feel the weight of the hammer. All that mattered was that he have faith in Tyre, and more importantly, in himself. Kern's hammer moved through the air. Trooper tried to parry, but proved a fraction of a second too slow. Hammer struck sword and the blade flew out of Trooper's hands, whirling through the air. Kern lowered his hammer, breathing hard. A grin spread across his face. Trooper nodded in approval as he retrieved his sword. Not bad, son. Not bad at all. A sly smile curled inside his beard. But then, next time I won't play so nicely. Kern's grin slowly faded. Something told him he still had a great deal to learn. Well, it's time for an old man to get some sleep, Trooper grumbled, putting away his rune sword and pulling out his bedroll. He spread it close to the fire. I hope you all know that you've made a complete and utter mess of my day. We know, Listel replied sweetly, but you're glad that we did. He scowled at her. Well, I supposed I am at that, he said gruffly. And then he went to sleep. Judging by the rising crescent of the moon, it was well after midnight when Listel woke. She sat up and cocked her head, listening with her delicately pointed elven ears. There it was again, a voice whispering among the trees. She slipped quietly out of her blanket, noticing that Trooper's bedroll was empty. Kern was snoring, sound asleep, and Miltiades appeared deep in reverie, gazing into the last embers of the fire. Silently, so as not to disturb either, the elf padded away into the shadows of the forest. She followed the faint whispering, and moments later, peered from behind a juniper bush to see a peculiar sight. Trooper sat on an old stump, bathed in a faint blue radiance. The old paladin seemed to be engaged in a conversation with someone, though who it might be, Listel couldn't say. She didn't see anyone else in the clearing. Are you really certain he's worth the trouble? Trooper muttered his beard bristling. Oh, he's brave enough and strong, too, and I'll grant you that brains have never been a paladin's primary requisite. But he doesn't have much faith in himself, you know? The old man bent his head as though listening to some reply. He scratched his whiskers thoughtfully. True enough, faith can be taught, but it isn't easy and it takes time, a great deal of time, in fact, and that's something I really don't have too much of these days. Trooper paused. Finally, he sighed, nodding. Well, goes against my better judgment, he growled. However, I'll do it if you think I should. But you owe me for this one, Tyre. Listel's mouth opened in a silent gasp as she turned hastily away. Has she heard properly? That's ridiculous, Listel, she whispered to herself as she slipped soundlessly through the trees. He couldn't have been talking to, to a... Shivering, she left that thought unfinished as she hurried back to camp. Chapter 15 Shadows of Midnight Tarl stood on a balcony high in the Temple of Tyre, breathing the wintry air. He turned his gaze out over where he knew the city lay, though all his eyes saw was perpetual darkness. Twilight had fallen, he knew, 
for he could no longer feel the faint warmth of the sun on his face. But he welcomed the numbing cold of night. There had been no news of Kern or the others in the last days. No omen that might hint whether his son was alive or dead. Nothing. Anton said again and again that they must have faith, but Tarl found faith to be slight to comfort. Faith could not whisk his son to his side. Faith could not heal Shal, who lay slowly, inexorably dying in her chamber. Perhaps he would not feel so bad, Tarl thought, if there were anything he could do. Anything. But he was powerless. Nothing he did could wake Shal from her endless slumber or drive the shadows from her face. Nothing he could do would help Kern on his quest for the hammer. He couldn't even be of much help to his fellow clerics, who scurried about the temple like frightened mice, trying to fortify the structure against the dark onslaught Sister Sundara had foretold. Though he had tried to provide some assistance, he had only gotten in the way. Tarl gripped the balustrade with white-knuckled hands. There was nothing to do but wait. Wait for an end, some end to come. Finally, even the cold of the night was too much for him to bear. It was time to go back inside, to sit by Shal's side. Yet as Tarl started to step away from the balustrade, he saw something that made him hesitate. Something that moved in the veil of darkness. He frowned. There it was again, a small splotch that was a deeper jet against the blackness of his vision. He blinked, wondering if this was some figment of his imagination. But no, even as he watched, the spot grew, like a far-off object edging closer. This cannot be, Tarl whispered as the dark blob grew larger yet. How can I see something unless it is? Realization washed over him. Magic. Whatever was approaching the temple was magical in nature. As he had learned these last years, magic was one thing his otherwise useless eyes could discern. But what was the magical shape? Tarl leaned forward, concentrating on the dark cloud. As it neared, he realized that it was composed of dozens of smaller objects, each surrounded by a faint crimson aura. As the swarm of objects drew closer, the shapes became clearer with each passing second. By tire above, Tarl gasped. The dark cloud was not made up of objects, but of fiends. Tarl waited for the temple's magical alarms to sound. The shadow fiends were flying swiftly upon their midnight dark wings. They were mere minutes away from the temple's walls. Surely some of the other clerics had seen them by now. But the night remained deathly silent. Sound the alarm! Tarl gritted between his teeth. Are you all asleep? Sound the alarm! No hue and cry rang out. Then Tarl realized the obvious. The others could not see the shadow fiends. They were invisible to mundane eyes. Without further hesitation, he turned and dashed inside. He bashed his shins against an unseen chair, but ignoring the pain, stumbled on. He caught his shoulder on the doorframe, and pain exploded in his chest, but he ignored that too. He had to warn the others. Careening down the corridor like a madman, he began shouting, Beware! Clerics of Tyre! A foe comes in the night! Beware! When he came to the stairs leading to the main hall, he would have fallen and broken his neck had not Sister Karina, a cleric of middle years, been there to catch him. He explained what he had observed in short, gasping sentences. An intelligent woman with nerves as steely as her eyes, Sister Karina quickly helped Tarl downstairs and called for order among the small throng of clerics that had responded to Tarl's cry. 
Shadow fiends approach the temple, Tarl announced urgently. We must act. They will be here in mere minutes. Shadow fiends, Brother Dameron asked. The stout, round-faced young cleric wore a skeptical expression. I've never heard of such a thing. Are you certain you're not mistaken, Brother Tarl? Tarl caught the note of condescension in the scholarly cleric's voice. What is it, Brother Dameron? Tarl snarled. Do you think me a blind simpleton? Is that it? An old man who's lost his wits as well as his sight? Dameron's jaw worked soundlessly in surprise at the intensity in Tarl's voice. Forgive us, Tarl, Anton said. The grizzled patriarch's voice was grave and calm. You have caught us off guard, that is all. Quickly, tell us what we should do. They are creatures of darkness, Tarl said without hesitation. We must strengthen the temple's defenses against the substance that forms them. He pulled his ceremonial hammer from his belt, and despite his unseeing eyes, swung it in a precise arc. It struck a green stone circle in the center of the hall's floor. Under the force of his powerful blow, the circle of stone sank into the floor with a hissing sound. There was a loud grinding overhead as seven lines appeared on the inside surface of the bronze dome. Like the petals of a huge metallic flower, the dome split into seven sections, each receding slowly into the temple's walls to reveal a perfect circle of night sky. What have you done, Tarl? Dameron cried in horror. If foes do approach us, You've just opened the temple for them. Walls are no proof against creatures of shadow, Tarl replied intently. It is with magic that we will stop these beings. And for that, we must have a clear view. He raised his war hammer toward the circle of the sky. Now, clerics of Tyre! Even as his voice rang out, inky forms swirled out of the night. As one, the assembled clerics began their resonant chanting. A pale blue nimbus sprang into existence across the circular opening above the temple. Several of the shadow fiends approached the nimbus and instantly burst into flame as they breached the holy light. But several of the creatures were too fast and had already slipped through. These swooped down, landing lightly on three-toed claws. The crimson outlines of the magical fiends burned Tarl's vision. He swung his warhammer, its metal slicing through one of the creatures. The creature ripped to shreds, quickly evaporated. Sister Karina cried out as one of the fiends slashed at her back. Its head burst apart a moment later, crushed by Anton's hammer. A third fiend lifted Brother Dameron bodily and hurled him through the air. The rotund clerk struck a marble column. He slumped to the floor and did not rise again. The fiend whirled, its dark wings beating in agitation. Suddenly, a hammer flashed through the air, ripping through the shadow fiend. It hissed in pain, then melted into thin air. Sister Karina slumped back to the floor. The hand that had thrown the hammer was drenched in blood, but her face bore a look of grim satisfaction. Louder, clerics of Tyre! Tarl yelled as the shadow fiends fought the protective blue nimbus with their dark magic. The fiends surged forward as the holy light flickered. Then Tarl added his deep baritone to the combined voices of his brethren. The nimbus glowed with renewed energy, and a half dozen more shadow fiends shrieked as they were consumed by brilliant flame. So it went for the remainder of the long, dark night. At times, the voices of the clerics grew hoarse, their chanting faltered, and the shadow fiends nearly penetrated through the temple's protective barrier. But time and time again, Tarl's voice rang out above the others. And in his example, 
the other clerics found a reservoir of strength in their hearts. They chanted on. Then came the first golden rays of dawn. The shadow fiends writhed in torment as the light of the sun transfixed them, piercing them with its burning rays. They shrieked vile curses as their bodies dissipated. Then their screams faded into a sigh on the wind. A golden radiance filled the temple. The morning light had banished the shadows of midnight. The temple's clerics sank to the floor, exhausted. The tide of evil had been stemmed, and all knew it was due to Tarl's strength and bravery. It's good to have you back, Brother Tarl, Anton said gruffly, clapping a hand on Tarl's shoulder. Tarl smiled despite himself. You were right, as always, shall, he said inwardly, hoping that somehow she could hear him. Do not rejoice over much, clerics of Tyre, a crackled voice called out, casting a pall of silence over the hall. The ancient priestess, Sister Sindara, hobbled into the room, leaning heavily on a gnarled staff. You have defeated a great evil this night, it is true, the priestess proclaimed. But know that this battle was but the first drop of rain in the dark storm that is to sweep over us. Know this, and be ready. With that, the ancient priestess retreated back into her chamber. A somber quiet filled the hall along with the morning sunlight. Close your eyes, Kern, Trooper's voice was a low murmur in his ear. Open your heart and listen to the wind. Kern squeezed his eyes shut, doing his best to obey the elder paladin's words. The traveler stood in the middle of a high plain, ringed on all sides by sawtooth mountain ranges, gleaming white with snow. Wind hissed through the dry brown grass, making a beautiful yet forlorn sound. A palfrey is a fine riding horse, Trooper went on softly, but a true paladin must have a steed worthy of riding into battle. A charger, Kern. Let the wind carry your call for a charger. Kern's brow furrowed in concentration. He wasn't exactly certain how this was supposed to work. He had heard stories, of course, telling how famous paladins summoned snorting, stamping chargers to their sides with little more than wishful thoughts and prayers to tire. However, he had always assumed they were just that, fireside tales. Trooper had been all too happy to correct him. The weathered paladin told how he had summoned his own dun-colored stallion, Lancer, many years before, and Miltiades had in turn recounted how he had called his first charger long years ago. Now it was Kern's turn. He tried to imagine his message ringing out over the plains all the way to the distant mountains. A charger, Tyre, he thought. Let a charger heed my call. After a long moment, his eyes blinked open. Now what? he asked. Trooper gave a quizzical look, then shrugged his thin shoulders. Now, we journey on. If a steed has heard your call, it will find us. If it didn't run as fast as it could in the other direction, that is, Listel added impertinently. Kern groaned. Listel, don't you have something better to do than make fun of me constantly? The elf thought about that for a moment. No, she decided finally, shooting him a winsome smile. Kern sighed. Just checking, he said gloomily. The four rode on across the frozen plain. No more than a quarter hour had passed when Kern heard something rustling through a nearby stand of tall, dry grass. His heart leaped in his chest. Could it be his charger? He dismounted peering into the high grass expectantly. With a snort, something burst into the open. 
Listel's trilling laughter rang out brightly. I don't know, Kern, she said with mock gravity. Don't you think it might be difficult to joust with your heels dragging the ground? <laughs> Very funny, Kern snapped hotly. He glared downward as the beast he had summoned oinked happily, nuzzling its bristly snout against his leg. I have only one question, Kern, Trooper said, his eyes sparkling. Do you think you should ride it or roast it? I'm not laughing, he grouched. Kern shook his leg, trying to get away from the pig. It grunted and trotted after him, its pink eyes shining with affection. It took the better part of an hour, and all the hazelnuts left in Kern's saddlebags to convince the pig to trot back into the tall grass. Finally, the four rode on. It was nearing sundown when the riders halted on the edge of the plains. They made camp in a grove of oak trees at the foot of a high mountain. While the others busied themselves, Kern wandered to the edge of the grove. The westering sun had set the plains afire with color. A cold wind rushed down from the mountains, tangling his red hair. Before he even knew what he was doing, he closed his eyes, once again sending out the call. It was hard to forget Listel's laughter or the amusement in Trooper's wrinkled eyes. Kern clenched his hands into fists. He had to show them that he could do it. Besides, he thought, there wouldn't be any witnesses if he failed this time. He cast his thoughts to the wind, calling out with all his spirit. How long he stood there, he wasn't certain. But when he finally opened his eyes, the sun had dipped below the horizon, and purple twilight was filling the arms of the mountains. For a time, Kern listened, but heard nothing except the soft, lonely voice of the wind. With a sigh, he turned back to camp, hoping the others wouldn't guess what he had been trying to do. Unfortunately, his worst fears were realized the moment he stepped into the small clearing where they had set up camp. Listel, Trooper, and Miltiades were all staring at him. Er... Uh, Kern, the elf said after a moment's pause. You've, uh, been trying to summon a charger again, haven't you? His shoulders drooped in dismay. How did you know? Oh, it's just intuition, Listel grinned crookedly. That and the big horse that's following you. What? Kern whirled about, his jaw dropping in surprise. He must have been so caught up in his gloomy reverie that he hadn't even noticed. The steel-gray charger snorted softly, tossing its proud head. It moved forward, nuzzling Kern's outstretched hand. It was the most beautiful horse he had ever seen. Not bad, son, Trooper said, scratching his long white beard thoughtfully. Not bad at all. You've gained the second power of a paladin, Kern, Miltiades announced gravely. But don't let it go to your head, Trooper quickly interjected. His bushy eyebrows bristled wildly. You still have yet to master the third and final power, and that is the hardest one of all. Kern, stroking the charger's smoothly muscled neck, barely heard the old paladin. Your name will be Nocturne, he murmured softly. The charger snorted, stamping a hoof, as if it was already aware of this fact. All the next day, they picked their way along the narrow mountain trails. They kept to the valleys as best they could, but twice they were forced to guide their mounts up high passes, treacherous with snow and ice. The day was clear and cold, and at times the sunlight reflecting off the snow was blinding. Despite the difficult terrain, they made good time. They were able to use Kern's palfrey as a pack horse. 
and that lightened the burdens the other mounts had to bear. Sitting astride Nocturne, Kern felt as if he had ridden the massive gray charger a thousand times before. The horse seemed to know exactly what Kern wanted him to do, a half second before Kern even thought it himself. The charger was strong and sure-footed, eager to take the lead, breaking trail through high drifts of snow, picking the best route across dangerous stretches of loose scree. Twilight found the companions deep in the mountains, seeking shelter among the pines in a narrow gulch. Listel had cast a spell of divination, hoping to discover if they were near Yvain, but she could not yet detect any traces of the sorceress. Kern and Listel scouted through the forest in the gathering gloom, looking for firewood. I wonder how Dale is, Kern said as he broke a dead branch from a fallen tree. I hope she had better luck with the flying carpet than we did, Listel replied, gathering some dried moss. What do you mean, we? As I recall, you were the one steering the thing. Hmm, now, Listel murmured sweetly, as if she hadn't heard him. I wonder if there are any nice mushrooms around here. She poked among the thick carpet of fallen pine needles. Ones with pretty purple and red splotches would be nice. She smiled nastily. After all, Kern just loves mushrooms. Kern groaned and moved off to find more firewood. A short while later, the two started back toward camp, Kern's arms full of wood and Listel's pouches full of tinder. And, Kern suspected, poison mushrooms. Make yourself useful for a change, Kern, the elf said when they reached the steep, slippery bank of a small gully. Give me a hand, Kern scrambled up the slope, dropping his load of wood at the top. Here, take my hand, he said, reaching down. She put her small hand in his, and he heaved her up the slope. However, as Kern leaned back, his heels skidded on a patch of loose rock. Both he and Listel went tumbling head over heels back into the gully. Kern grunted as he struck bottom, and a half second later he grunted again as something heavy landed right on his chest, knocking the air out of him. Thanks for breaking my fall, Kern, Listel laughed, gazing down at him. The two had fallen in a tangle of limbs, the elf on top. Perhaps there's hope for you yet. That was very chivalrous. Don't mention it, he gasped. Now unless you're trying to suffocate me, could you please get off me? Listel started to untangle herself from him, but suddenly she paused, her silvery eyes sparkling. And what if I don't want to? she asked slyly. What do you mean, what if you don't want to? Kern wheezed. The elf seemed to think about something for a moment. Suddenly, she laughed, almost as if she had made a decision of some sort. She ran her slender fingers through his tousled red hair. Maybe I like being this close to you. Did you ever think of that? He was about to inform her that, no, he'd never thought of that, when she kissed him rendering speech quite impossible, at least for the moment. Kern's green eyes widened in shock. A second later, Listel sprang to her feet. Well, don't just lie there, the elf scolded him. We have to get this wood back to camp. This time, she nimbly scrambled unaided up the embankment. Kern felt a bit dazed. His lips tingled oddly and a curious fragrance lingered in his nose, a scent like wildflowers in spring. Finally, he shook his head, pulling himself to his feet. He clambered up the slope, hastily picking up the fallen firewood and hurrying after the elf. Why in the world had Listel kissed him? He felt more certain than ever that he would never understand the unpredictable elf. She made absolutely no sense. However, he couldn't help but think about kissing her again as he trailed after her. 
Maybe the experience would be just as pleasant the second time around. Kern picked up his pace. The fleet-footed elf had disappeared among the trees now, and he wondered if she was laying an ambush for him. Not that he was so certain he would mind. A scream shattered the forest air. Kern froze in his tracks. Listel! He threw his load of firewood to the ground and broke into a run, gripping the hammer of tire as he went. Branches whipped past him. Moments later, he burst into a small glade. What he saw sent a shiver down his spine. Listel was trying to fend off the attack of a monstrous creature. The thing was like nothing Kern had ever seen before. It was the size of an ogre, but instead of arms, it had several tentacles springing from each of its shoulders. The long, scaly appendages cracked like whips. The thing's body was covered with long, kelp-like hair, and its misshapen head bore only a solitary, sickly green eye. The creature opened a mouth filled with black, spiny teeth. I have been searching for you for a long time, Listel, it rasped. Your master, Sapphire, wishes to see you. The thing lashed out at the terrified elf with one of its tentacles. She shrank back against a tree, narrowly dodging the mighty blow. Kern shouted as he charged. At the same moment, two other forms dashed into the clearing, Miltiades and Trooper. They were actually closer to the creature and reached it first. With his cadaverous grin, Miltiades plunged his sword into the creature's midriff. The blade passed through the monster without effect. It is an illusion, Miltiades called out. But in that same instant, a dark tentacle struck him in the chest, hurling him across the glen. The skeletal paladin's armor rattled as he fell to the ground. It hits awfully hard for an illusion, Trooper growled. Barely ducking a thrashing tentacle, he swung his rune sword, but the creature did not back off. We can't hurt it, but it sure can hurt us. The thing stalked toward Listel, who was pinned against the tree, paralyzed with fear. Sephir was most disappointed when you escaped from his tower, Listel, it hissed. Kern reached the melee, heart pounding. He swung his hammer, but nearly dislocated his shoulder as the weapon whooshed effortlessly through the monster's insubstantial body. No, Kern, Trooper shouted. Don't just strike at the illusion. Use the hammer's magic to break the enchantment. Kern nodded grimly, unsure just what Trooper meant. Even as he raised the hammer for another try, the creature struck at Listel. With a tentacle, it ripped the ruby pendant from her throat. She screamed as the silver chain snapped. The gem flashed blood fire. Sephir's necklace! The beast screeched in triumph, holding the gem aloft. Its tentacles encircled the helpless elf, ready to squeeze the life out of her. Now or never, Kern thought. Help me end this evil magic, Tyre! He whispered fiercely. The hammer of Tyre glowed with sapphire light. Kern did not hesitate. He thrust the shining weapon deep into the illusionary beast's chest. He felt a jolt of energy course up his arm, but held his grip. The beast roared in agony. Blue lightning sizzled through its body. The tentacles clutching Listel evaporated in a puff of acrid smoke. The elf sank weakly to the ground. The creature writhed as azure lightning engulfed it. Suddenly, the crackling blue energy coalesced into a single jagged bolt that arced into the hammer. The weapon flashed brilliantly, then went dim. The monster was gone. Shoving the hammer into his belt, Kern rushed to the elf. 
Listel, are you all right? He reached down to help her to her feet, but his hands passed right through her body. Don't touch me, she screamed. She scrambled forward, grabbing the pulsating ruby pendant which had fallen to the ground. He stared at her in shock. Her form seemed to be flickering in and out of existence. In dull amazement, he realized he could see right through her. Trooper and Miltiades approached silently, standing behind Kern. Listel grabbed the ruby necklace, hastily fastening it around her throat. The gem flared, then dimmed to a steady glow. The elf's form grew substantial once again, transparent no longer. Slowly, she looked at Kern, her face moon pale in the twilight, her silvery eyes filled with anguish. I'm sorry, Kern, she whispered. Abruptly, she sprang to her feet and dashed away through the trees, her sobs fading in the distance. Chapter 16 Shattered Illusions The crescent moon had risen well above the treetops by the time Listel finally stepped into the light of the campfire. Kern gazed at her silently, not knowing what to say, or even what he felt. A bowl of trooper's rabbit stew sat on the ground before him, untouched. I suppose I owe you all some sort of explanation, the elf said, sitting gingerly on a log across from Kern. Her face looked tight and drawn. Perhaps, Trooper said quietly. The paladin's eyes glinted like blue glass. But then, not all secrets are meant to be shared. The elf took a deep breath. I think this one has to be. She smiled crookedly, her expression wistful. I wish I could tell you this was all just another one of my practical jokes, but... Her words faltered. Kern ran a frustrated hand through his tangled red hair. He couldn't hold back any longer. Listel, what was that creature? And why was it hunting you? And what... What happened when I tried to help you up? His questions trailed off into awkward silence. I guess you haven't ever heard the phrase, one thing at a time, have you, Kern? Listel said wryly. But that's all right. I'll try to tell you everything. In a deep breath, she began her story. Kern already knows how, ten years ago, I escaped from the tower of the wizard Sifah here. Believe me when I say that there has never been an elvish mage as black-hearted as he was. Listel could not suppress a shudder. Three centuries ago, he was counselor to the Queen of Evermeet, the land of the silver elves far across the trackless sea. For a time, Safar here used his powers to help the Queen keep her island safe from pirates and sea monsters. But gradually, he found other, less benevolent uses for his magic. With his spells, Safahir would torture confessions of treason out of innocent elves and wreak magical destruction upon villagers that couldn't pay his cruel taxes. As time went on, his schemes grew even darker. He began to whisper wicked plans of conquest in the queen's ear and to warn her of treacherous plots against her life concocted, so he said, by her closest friends and loved ones. He advised that she execute them all. Finally, the queen realized his true evil. However, since it's against elven nature to take a life, even one as evil as Sifah hears, she exiled him to a small, barren island north of Evermeet. The fire sent shadows dancing across Listel's face. Kern leaned forward to catch her soft words. The island Sifahir was exiled to was little more than a collection of jagged rocks jutting up above the waves. The elf went on. 
Despite his might, Sephahir was condemned to stay in that desolate place. The queen of the silver elves is not without powerful enchantments herself, and she cast a jeez upon him. Should he ever set foot off the, his island, he would perish. But if she thought this meant he would never be able to work evil in the world again, then the good queen was wrong. Listel shook her head sadly. Sephahir raised a dark tower, and from it he spun a magical web, its tendrils reaching farther and farther with every passing year. He could never hope to leave the island, but with his evil web he was able to draw others to him. The unlucky would find their boats pulled off course to Sephahir's island. Their vessels crashed to splinters on the rocky shore, stranding them. Then, as his power expanded, he discovered ways to create evil servants that could venture forth into the world to retrieve objects for him. Books of arcane lore, objects of magical power, and even other people. She gazed at Kern. That is what attacked me in the glen, one of Sephahir's servants. I, I never imagined one of his creatures could travel so far from his island prison. She shook her head and went on. With his web and his conjured minions, Sephahir captured and enslaved countless elves. The weaponsmith Primal was one of them, and the elven mages Brookwine and Winebrook were two more. Most of Sephahir's prisoners died in the course of his terrible experiments, but a few were kept alive to serve him. Like you, Listel, Trooper asked gently. She laughed then, but it was a rueful laugh. So unusual coming from the typically buoyant elf. No, Trooper, she said sorrowfully. That wasn't the case with me. You see, I didn't come to the island. Anguish shone in her silver eyes. The island was where I first came to be. Realization struck Kern cold and terrible. He, he created you, didn't he? He could barely speak the words. Sephahir conjured you, just like he did the creature in the glen. He shook his head. But that means you're, you're a... She nodded, trembling. An illusion, Kern. I began my existence as an illusion, conjured by Sephahir's magic to guard his treasure chamber. Kern worked his jaw silently. What could he possibly say? But... An illusion is simply an image, Trooper said with a bushy-eyebrowed scowl. Illusions are nothing more than figments of the imagination. They cannot think or act of their own free will or play practical jokes. No, Listel agreed, they can't. She shivered, drawing closer to the fire. I have only vague recollections of the time when I was created. More like dreams, really. I remember existing in Sephahir's treasure chamber. I would appear if intruders ventured within and used the magic Sephahir had granted me to confront them. There was never any conscious thought in my actions. Her voice grew even more quiet, her gaze intent. But then, then something happened. What caused it to happen, I don't think I'll ever know. Perhaps it was simply the aura of magic that pervaded the treasure chamber, radiated by all the artifacts it contained. Whatever the cause, one day I realized that I had become conscious. I was fully aware of what I was. No, of who I was, and what I was doing. At first, it was simply a curious, wonderful sensation, 
but as time went on, my sense of self grew stronger. I began to feel pity for the people I was forced to use my magic on. Then, grief. Finally, I came to understand Safahir's true nature and knew that I could serve him no longer. I decided to escape. It was the first independent decision I ever made. She touched her ruby pendant, its light dormant now. As the guardian of Safahir's treasure, I knew each item down to the least coin. This necklace was one of his most prized possessions. It was forged by gnome illusionists long ago and enhanced his magic greatly. But he did not understand all of its secrets. I sensed that it had the power to grant me life. She swallowed hard. As long as I wore the necklace, my body would be no different than a living elf is. So you took the necklace and escaped from the tower, Miltiadi said solemnly. She nodded. It was easy. Safar here had never expected one of his own illusions to betray him, since I could will myself to become insubstantial and pass through walls, I managed to free some of the prisoners, Primal, and a few others locked in the dungeons. We fled through the tower's gates. That was where I discovered Winebrook and Brookwine. Their bodies were sunk deeply into the stone archway where for years they had been forced to use their magic to strengthen the iron gate. I was able to reach into the stone and pull them free. Her eyes grew distant. I remember that day so clearly. Primal picked up the two old mages as if they were thin sticks. They were so pale, so brittle. I didn't see how they could survive. We dashed through the gates and to the sea. Then I realized we had no way to escape the island. But somehow, despite their weakness, Brookwine and Winebrook sent forth a call, and a half-dozen dolphins lifted their heads above the waves. We dove into the water, and the dolphins bore us away from the island. By that point, bolts of green lightning were shooting from the tower's turrets. Too late, Safar here had discovered our escape. Listel's shoulders sagged. The dolphins dropped us on the shores of Evermeet, and ever since we've all been fleeing from Safar here's minions. He means to recapture us, and he wants me most of all. She fidgeted with her necklace. It has been over three years since the last attack. I had started to think that maybe he had lost us forever. But I know now that I was wrong. Safar here will never rest until he's regained the necklace and exacted his revenge. What will happen to you? Kern found himself asking almost against his will. Listel stared at the others. I'll become an illusion once again. A silence descended on the small clearing. Kern tried to sort out all Listel had told him. The elf had always been unpredictable. But this, this was unfathomable. A dozen emotions clashed in his heart. Sorrow that Listel had known such anguish. Anger that the evil mage that dogged her footsteps... Fear that the elf might vanish in a puff of smoke at any moment. But most of all, he felt a profound confusion. Only a short while ago, after she had kissed him, he had seen Listel in a whole new light. Feelings he had never imagined before had stirred in his heart. But now he didn't know what to feel. How could he love someone who wasn't even real? Listel stood, her jaw set, with deep sorrow in her eyes. I'm sorry I've lied to you all for so long. I... I can understand if you want me to leave. 
She started to gather her things. Listel, do not. Miltiades began, but he was interrupted by two brilliant sparks of light floating into the clearing. Both were a shimmering aquamarine. The one spark was slightly more green than blue, and the other slightly more blue than green. Abruptly, the sparks flashed, and in their place stood two ancient, sweet-faced elves. Brookwine! Winebrook! Listel exclaimed. Trooper raised a bushy eyebrow in surprise, casting a glance at Kern. Kern nodded, confirming the paladin's unspoken question. These were the two elven mages from Listel's story. Listel, Brookwine began in his tremulous voice. We are so glad that we have found you, Winebrook went on without pause. Primal sent us to warn you that one of Safahir's minions has discovered your whereabouts. You're in terrible danger. The two elves finished as one. Listel sighed, reaching out and holding their fine boned hands. I know, she said glumly. I was attacked a few hours ago, but that particular beast will trouble us no more, thanks to my friends here. Quickly, she relayed the tale of their encounter with Safahir's illusionary minion. When she finished, the two wispy mages bowed deeply to the others. We are most grateful for your slaying of the beast that sought to deliver us into Safarhir's hands once again. The elves smiled their beguiling smiles, eyes glowing green-blue and blue-green. Uh, don't mention it, Trooper said, seeming at a loss as he turned his gaze from one mage to the other. Can you stay a while? Listel asked the two ancient mages, hopefully, but Brookwine and Winebrook shook their heads. I'm afraid we dare not linger, dear Listel. We must return to inform Primal of this development, they said in their fluid manner. You know how the green elf thinks us to be flighty and how angry he gets when we dilly-dally. Listel laughed despite her recent ordeal, seeing her old friends always lifted her heart, no matter the circumstances. Take care, you two, she whispered, hugging them tightly. And don't let Primal bully you. In a wink, the mages vanished, and two glowing sparks fluttered out of the clearing. Listel fell silent then. Her worst fears had been realized. Her secret had been revealed. She knew the others would never regard her the same way again, especially Kern. Trooper spoke, as if sensing her thoughts. Well, let's have no more talk of leaving tonight, he said testily. It's too late for such serious matters, and this old man needs his sleep. With that, he rolled himself in his blanket and almost instantly began snoring. Listel saw Kern gazing at her, the expression in his eyes impossible to read. She took a hesitant step toward him, wishing he would say something, anything. For a moment, she thought he was going to, but then he too turned away, and climbing into his bedroll, shut his eyes tightly. Listel felt a preternatural chill behind her. She looked up to see Miltiades. The paladin seemed to be regarding her with his empty eyes. It is a burden, being so different, is it not? He said softly in his eerie voice. Yes, she whispered, it is. You must not despair, Listel on a portum, he said, a stern note in his usually gentle voice. You fought hard to have the chance to live. Do not throw it away for any reason. With that, the skeletal knight stepped away into the shadows, leaving her feeling completely and utterly alone.
A scream of rage filled the cavern of the Pool of Twilight. Why did you not tell me that sunlight would destroy my beautiful shadow fiends? Serana ranted. Her lovely hands were clenched into claws. Her misshapen face twisted even more grotesquely than usual. Was it not obvious? The guardian of the pool asked mockingly. They were creatures of darkness. How could they possibly withstand the burning rays of the sun? Serana's wings flapped violently, casting off spatters of greasy black feathers. Tell me, great guardian of the pool, she spoke acidly. You, who promised me so much power, tell me, why does my revenge yet go unfulfilled? Bubbles burst sluggishly on the pool's metallic surface. As I told you long ago, sorceress, you are dealing with powerful forces. There is only one way you will ever gain the power you need to exact your vengeance. Sparkling flecks of twilight appeared in the pool, swirling at its center. You must enter the pool. Serana shook her head. Though entranced by the specks dancing beneath the pool's surface, even as similar sparks swirled beneath her dusty skin, she knew she must not enter the pool of twilight. To do so would mean imprisonment beneath its murky depths. But, she mused, wouldn't it be worth the price to finally gain sufficient power to exact her revenge? Serana had no idea if that stray thought was her own or the Guardian's. The flecks of twilight swirled faster, becoming a hypnotic whirlpool. Wouldn't entering the pool be worth the small sacrifice? She could avenge her father's death and bring about the destruction of that wretched city, Flan, once and for all. Slowly, she began to approach the edge of the pool. It wasn't as if she would have to be the pool's guardian forever, she reminded herself. She had only to wait until the first unwary traveler happened upon the cavern. How easy it would be to convince some lesser being to enter the pool's depths. Serana balanced on the rocky edge. The turgid water lapped mere inches below her clawed feet. Come, sorceress. Is not vengeance worthwhile, whatever the cost? Yes, she whispered, the swirling flecks of twilight reflected in her blankly staring eyes. I must have my vengeance. Serana plunged into the pool of twilight. She felt as if she were freezing into ice and burning to ashes all at once. The thick fluid dragged her body down. Sparks flashed in front of her eyes. The lack of oxygen seared her lungs. She clamped her mouth shut, fighting the urge to draw a breath. Oh, why had she done this foolish thing? Her consciousness began to grow faint. Finally, she could stand it no longer. She opened her mouth, filling her lungs with the pool's water in one horrible, shuddering breath. She was not drowning. She took another breath of this thick, metallic water, and another, and another. With each, she felt incredible energy pulsing through her veins, infusing every fiber of her being. The power she had experienced before was nothing compared to the primal magic she now felt coursing through her body, forging her anew into something awesome and terrible, into the guardian of the pool. Even as Serana reveled in her new incarnation, the waters of the pool began to froth and bubble furiously, 
In a spray of shimmering foam, a huge creature burst forth from its waters and soared toward the heights of the cavern. Free! A wild, thunderous voice trumpeted. After all these centuries, at last I'm free! The massive creature whirled about the cavern, stretching his midnight wings in ecstasy. The black dragon was a great, ancient beast, armored with countless scales as hard and gleaming as onyx. The dragon's name was Dusk. And in all the Northlands of Faerun, there was not an older or more powerful creature of his kind. A full two hundred feet from his horned snout to the spike-studded tip of his tail, there was strength enough in his claws to rend mountains to dust. The dragon alighted beside the pool. One of his black eyes shone in utter satisfaction, while the other was dim and clouded, blinded by an ancient but not forgotten wound. That foolish, half-fiend Serana had finally yielded to the temptation the dragon had dangled before her. Now she would be the pool's guardian, trapped in its silvery waters. Now Dusk would do what Serana had been too weak and moronic to accomplish. Completely and utterly destroy the abominable city of Flan. Memories flickered through Dusk's mind. Three centuries ago, he had ruled the skies over the moon sea. All the cities along the coast had lived in fear of his shadow. Dusk had plundered wherever he went, amassing a hoard of riches that made the treasure of a hundred kings pale in significance. Then he had devised his most brilliant plan. He flew from mountain peak to mountain peak, from ruin to ruin, speaking with the other evil dragons that lived along the shores of the moon sea. With sly, cunning words, he played upon the hatred that all dragons felt for human, dwarven, and elven kind. He lit a spark in the hearts of the evil dragons, red, blue, green, and black, until that spark grew into a burning wildfire. One dark dawn, a hundred dragons flew from their hidden lairs to join his army and fight as one, assailing all the lands around the moon sea. Thus began the first dragon rage. Folk cowered in their cities as destruction rained down from above. Fire and acid, lightning and poisonous clouds, mayhem and devastation. Dragon wings blotted out the sun, and dragon roars boomed like thunder. It was glorious, and Dusk was the most magnificent of them all. The other dragons looked to him as their exalted leader. The tribute they had agreed to pay would make him lord over a mountain of treasure such as Ferun had never seen. Or it would have come to pass, had it not been for Andahar Longarm. Andahar was the latest in Flan's irksomely endless supply of champions. Heroes seemed to breed like lice in that wretched city. Just as the dragon rage was nearing the peak of its frenzy, Dusk had made the mistake of flying too close to Flan's walls. Standing atop the city's battlements, Andahar had loosed an enchanted arrow from his bow. Guided by magic, the barbed shaft had struck Dusk in his left eye. Dusk had never known such agony. He had spun wildly through the air, blinded by the pain. He fell to the ground and crawled away. Without his leadership, the evil dragons began to bicker among themselves. Hatred and suspicion flared. The dragon rage descended into chaos as the worms sped back to the guard their lairs from each other, leaving Dusk to flee abjectly to the mountains. He never forgot the cheers rising from the walls of Flan, and he had vowed to exact his revenge upon that blasted city and all the vile folk that inhabited it. 
dusk had limped into a cavern deep in the Dragonspine Mountains, intent upon licking his wounds until he gathered the strength once again to assault Flan. But he had not counted on the Pool of Twilight. He had stumbled upon it by accident, and in his delirium of pain and anger had succumbed to the tempting offers of power made to him by the storm giant, who was the pool's guardian. Dusk had agreed to enter the pool in the hope of gaining the power he needed to recuperate and wreak the ultimate vengeance. The storm giant had been freed, while Dusk found himself trapped. Over time, Dusk had discovered he could use the power of the pool to compel the multitudes of monsters that inhabited the mountains to do his bidding. All it took were a few droplets from the pool, mixed with the underground streams that flowed below the cavern. Once the streams passed into the outside world, all manner of creatures drank from their waters, thus falling under Dusk's sway. Over the centuries, he had amassed great hordes of creatures and sent them to attack Flan. Time and time again the monsters failed, dying by the thousands against Flan's stubborn walls. Eventually, Dusk realized that there was only one way he could destroy Flan. He had to launch a new dragon rage. And now that he was finally free, he could do just that. Only this time, he would not send a hundred dragons against the city of the Moon Sea. He would send a thousand. He would not be simply a prince of his kind or even a king. He would be an emperor of dragons, and all the lands around the Moon Sea would cower in fear before him. Dusk unfolded his huge shadowy wings exulting at the glorious victory that would soon be his. Ah, but first, he had to say a fond goodbye to Serana. As the pool's new guardian, it would be her honor to grant him the power he needed to summon the evil Wyrms for a new dragon rage. Serana, he called out, heed my call! Why should I, Wyrm? The sorceress's voice echoed in his mind with a sound like laughter. It was clear she was enjoying her newfound status as the pool's guardian and was intoxicated by the incredible power. Serana was even more of a fool than Dusk had imagined. The dragon grinned evilly, displaying row after row of dagger-like teeth. Obey my wishes, sorceress, or I will pulverize the mountains, sealing this cavern under so much rubble that it will never be discovered. You will remain here imprisoned forever. He could feel fury radiating from the pool, along with just a hint of fear. His feral grin widened. She would be forced to serve him. Very well, she replied sullenly. What do you wish, Wyrm? Don't call me that, he hissed dangerously. He crawled toward the edge of the pool, seeing his dark and sinuous beauty reflected in its surface. Now, grant me power enough to summon a thousand dragons. I will grant you what I can but I must retain enough power for myself so that I can create a new army to send against Flan. The dragon roared with laughter. Believe me, sorceress, nothing you can do while trapped within the pool will be enough to destroy that city. I've tried myself a hundred times over. He felt disbelief radiate from the pool. But do not fear, he continued wickedly. Once the dragon rage has begun, Flan will be blasted off the face of Toril. We will both have our revenge. His one good eye glinted sharply. Now, sorceress, grant me the power of the pool. As you wish. A dully shining tendril lifted itself from the surface of the pool, 
It reached toward dusk, coiling about his body. The dragon threw his head back in a roar as the tendril tightened about him. He felt the pool's magic flowing into him. More, he screamed, wings beating, more! Finally, the tendril slipped back into the pool. Dusk stumbled backward, his head reeling. Ah, but it was exquisite to be free and so full of power. Deep within the pool, Serana laughed smugly to herself. Like everything, even laughing was a new exciting experience. All sense of her own body was gone now. Her senses seemed to mingle with the waters of the pool. The vast amount of magical energy she had just granted Dusk was but a fraction of the entire source. So, in all these centuries, with all the might of the pool at his beck and call, the stupid dragon could not manage to destroy Flan. Bah! Let the Wyrm try his dragon rage, thought Serana. By the time he arrives at Flan, he will find it a smoking ruin. She felt certain that she would succeed first where the dragon had failed. Without the hammer of Tyre, Flan had fallen into dark decay. The walls crumbled in disrepair, and the death gates hung open on their hinges, practically an invitation for an army of destruction to enter. Now all Serana had to do was to create that army. With all the pool's power flowing through her, she cast forth a summons. It vibrated through the bedrock, pulsing out in waves, spreading throughout the dragon-spine mountains. Scant seconds later, the first to heed her call shuffled into the cavern. A motley throng of dull-eyed creatures approached the pool. Bears and elk, eagles and snakes, insects and worms. There were monsters as well, goblins, orcs, owl bears, gnolls and giants. Among them, too, were humans, dwarves and even elves. All of them were dead. Some were only in the first stages of decay, their pallid skin mostly unblemished covered with fine, moist bits of leaf litter. Others were riddled with worm-eaten holes, their swollen flesh dripping off their bodies in goblets. All lurched toward the pool, compelled by her call. Without the slightest hesitation, the zombies toppled over the pool's edge, submerging themselves in the metallic waters. In new, horrible forms, they clambered clumsily out the opposite side. A rotting goblin with hissing zombie snakes sprouting from its eye sockets was the first. Then came a dwarf with a screaming eagle's claw sunk deep into its shoulders. A pixie stumbled out, black widow spiders bobbing from threads attached to its hands. A slack-jawed deer staggered to its feet. A dozen decomposing badgers skewered upon its antlers, snapping and hissing. A bow-wielding elf fused to the shoulders of a hill giant was followed by a gnome covered with undead stinging insects. An orc sprouted from the back of a mountain lion, the gaping, fang-toothed maw of a wolf snapping violently was embedded in the chest of a human man. More and more abominations climbed out of the pool's waters in a steady stream. And still more. Serana's laughter bubbled to the surface of the pool. Flan would never stand against her army of zombie abominations. She intensified her summons, compelling yet more putrid corpses to lurch into motion and begin their trek toward the pool of twilight. Disgusted by the reek of Serana's vile creations, Dusk turned to slither down a passageway. 
Despite his vast size, his sinuous body glided easily through the twists and turns. He sensed the nearness of the outside, and in a spray of stone and rubble, he burst through the wall of rock. Like a black comet, he soared through the air, winging high over the jagged mountains. Ah, to fly free once again. For a while, he simply wheeled through the air, pumping his great dark wings, thrilled by long-forgotten sensations. But his purpose burned within him. He had all the power he needed from the pool. Now, to seek out the other evil dragons of the Moon Sea, and once again fan the spark of hatred in their hearts. As he flew over the mountains, there was no way dusk could have known that brilliant, twilight-colored flecks of light danced in his one good eye. Chapter 17 The Wild Gift The frigid wind whipped through Dale's hair as her magic carpet sped through the air high above the Dragon Spine Mountains. She knew she would stop and make camp. It was reckless to fly so fast in the darkness. Several times she had narrowly avoided pinnacles of rock looming before her or the outstretched branches of tall trees. But still she gripped the carpet's tassels, guiding it onward. She had barely paused in her journey since leaving the Valley of the Falls two days ago. Not that it had been easy to leave. No, she thought ruefully. Leaving had been the hardest thing she had ever done. Her mind drifted back to that cold gray day. She had buried Wren in a cairn of stones next to Celia, below the glittering frozen cathedral of the waterfall. After she had placed the last rock on the cairn, she simply sat there and stared at the motionless water, not knowing what to do. She had never felt so utterly alone. In her gloom, she almost hadn't seen the trio of orcs that crept into the clearing behind her. But at the last moment, she caught a reflection of the pig-snouted creatures in the glassy surface of the waterfall. She'd whirled around as the orcs bared their yellow tusks and drew their rusted short swords. Then the bloodthirsty monsters had charged. In the space of a heartbeat, Dale had raised her bow and with icy calm loosed three arrows in rapid succession. The orcs had dropped in their tracks, looks of dull-witted astonishment on their warty faces, each with a red-feathered arrow protruding from its throat. Dale had lowered her bow, feeling a strange warmth surging through her blood. It was as if the attack had broken her from the grip of a spell. For the next three days, she'd prowled the valley from end to end, from river to ridgetop searching. Every creature of evil she found had fallen prey to her arrows. Orcs, cobbles, even trolls were her quarry. All that filled her mind was the hunt. She had stalked the forest as if it were her natural home, and she a hunter born to the wild. Finally, there had been no more monsters to slay. Those few that might have remained had heard of her deadly bow and fled. Dale had returned to the small stone keep as a great weariness came over her. She'd slept for a day and a night, and when she woke, it was again as if waking from a spell. What had happened to her? She had almost lost herself to the wilds. How much longer could it have gone on before she became the same as any beast? She shuddered, vowing never to lose control of herself like that again. Suddenly, thoughts of Kern and the others had come crashing down on her. She had tarried too long. With one last glance at the valley that had been her home, she had leaped on the magic carpet and soared into the sky. Finally, Dale realized she could keep her eyes open no longer. 
She had to stop and rest for just a few hours until the dawn. Then she would be on her way again. She pulled on the golden tassels and the carpet began to descend. A glimmer of light caught her eye. It quickly vanished, but a moment later she saw it again, a small, warm spark dancing in a dark grove of trees. Someone was down there. Instantly, all thoughts of sleep vanished from Dale's mind. She jerked hard on the tassels and the carpet sped toward the firelight. As she drew closer, she could make out two figures in the flickering circle. Quickly, she dug in her pack and pulled out the cylindrical scrying glass that had been her father's. When she lifted it to her eyes, her heart leaped in her chest. Yvain and Gamaliel, the long-haired sorceress, lay near the fire. Her eyes closed in sleep while the tawny cat sat on his haunches keeping watch. Dale grinned exultantly. She started to lower the scrying glass, then suddenly halted. A third figure had drifted into the clearing. It was a thing of shadows. All she could make out were sharp, moon-bright teeth and countless twig-like fingers. She drew in a sharp breath. Whatever it was, it was heading straight for Yvain. The great cat was staring into the night, seemingly oblivious to the intruder. Come on, Gamaliel, Dale whispered. The cat did not stir as the shadow creature reached its long arms toward Yvain. Even as Dale watched through the scrying glass, the creature's spindly fingers touched the sorceress's brow. Yvain shuddered in her sleep. Gamaliel turned his head, as if sensing something was wrong, but it was clear that for some reason he could not see the creature. Dale knew she had to act. As the carpet sailed toward the clearing, she hastily set down the scrying glass and reached for her bow. But by the time she looked up, the shadow creature was gone. She shook her head. How could the thing have disappeared so suddenly? She lifted the scrying glass again to be sure. No, the shadow creature still cradled Yvain's head in its hands, bearing fangs in a milk-white grin. Dale realized the truth. The scrying glass must be enchanted. That was why she could see the shadow creature. Gamaliel was not to blame. It was up to her to save Yvain. Hastily, she set the scrying glass aside and raised her bow. If there is a way to wound a shadow, bow, show me what it is, she whispered fiercely. The magical weapon quivered in her hands. The two iron stones set into its wood humming brightly. Suddenly, scarlet flames crackled along the arrow. The crimson bolt streaked through the air. It passed a scant foot above Yvain's sleeping form and stopped in midair. The great cat leaped to his feet at this strange sight. Gamaliel, Yvain is being attacked, Dale shouted. Even as her words rang out, scarlet tongues of fire radiated from the arrow, outlining a writhing form, the shadow creature. With the aid of the magical fire, Dale and Gamaliel could see the thing clearly. It had lifted its twig fingers from Yvain and was scrabbling at the arrow protruding from its chest. Gamaliel lunged toward the thing, fangs bared. He snarled and leaped back as crimson fire seared his muzzle. The shadow creature grabbed at the cat with its branch-like arms ready to sink its needle fangs into Gamaliel's flesh. One more time, Bo, Dale whispered. Another blazing arrow plunged into the shadow monster. With a cry, the creature released Gamaliel and backed away, clawing at the arrow sunk into its eyeless face. Slowly, it lowered to the ground. The scarlet flames dimmed and vanished. Dale found that she could see the creature now, a motionless pool of shadow on the ground. Dale was about to call out to Gamaliel when the carpet lurched violently. The ranger swore. She hadn't been paying attention. 
There was a loud noise as the carpet snagged a tree branch. Then Dale felt herself falling. Fortunately, a thick bed of pine needles cushioned her impact. Gamaliel helped her to her feet, and as he did so, she realized he had metamorphosed into his human shape. He regarded her curiously. Scorch marks covered his arms where the magical flame from her arrows had burned him. Gamaliel, your wounds, he waved her words aside. It is nothing, he said gruffly. Your arrow saved us. Come, we must see to evane. The sorceress was already awake, though it was clear she was weak and dizzy. Whatever the creature was, it had obviously drained her with its deadly touch. I don't know how or why you found us, Tail, she said with a faint smile, but your timing is impeccable. Stiffly, she knelt to examine the pile of dark tatters, all that remained of the creature. I've heard of beings that feed upon their victims' dreams, Yvain sighed wearily. This explains why I felt so hollow and dispirited these last days. And I never suspected anything, Gamaliel said quietly. There was anger in his voice as well as anguish. Don't you dare be so foolish as to blame yourself, Gam, Yvain said sternly. There was no way you could have known. She turned her gaze toward the ranger. You picked a good night to find us, Dale. For six nights I've been growing weaker and weaker. Tonight would have been the seventh. After tonight I might have become one of those creatures myself. Dale stared in horror at the sorceress. There was nothing she could say. Yvain reached out and gripped her hand. Thank you, the sorceress said. They spent the remainder of the night close to the fire, each telling what had befallen them since they had parted company at Yvain's dwelling. The sorceress brewed a pot of herbal tea that would help restore her strength and offered a cup to the ranger. Dale sipped the fragrant liquid, gathering her thoughts. She told the tale of their journey to the ruins of the Red Tower, describing how Kern had fought the Ocelot and gained the Hammer of Tyre. She dreaded having to tell the story of her father's death once again, of having to relive that terrible moment. Yvain had been one of Wren's best friends. She deserved to know. Her brown eyes distant, Dale began to describe Wren's fatal battle with the Night Fiend. When she finished, she was surprised to realize that, somehow, it hadn't been quite as painful reliving the memory this time. I will miss him, Yvain said with a deep sigh. But Faerun is a better place because of Wren of the Blade, and a brighter place. His life had meaning, great meaning. It was all he would have wished. Don't ever forget that, Dale. Dale knew that she would not. Yvain was told all about the young archer's adventures, including the tale of Serana's treachery, and how the wild mage was in truth a half-fiend, the daughter of the red wizard Marcus. She's in league with the Pool of Twilight, Yvain, that's what the others were coming to warn you about. The sky had steadily brightened as they spoke. And now, the ruddy orb of the sun lifted itself above the snow-capped heights. As the first rays filtered their way into the clearing, the remains of the dream stalker began to smoke and bubble, evaporating before their eyes. In moments, there was no trace of the shadow creature left. They broke camp in the morning light. Yvain was still weak, her cheeks hollow and sunken. But now that the nightly attacks had ended, she thought she would quickly regain strength. The first thing to do was to locate Kern and the others. How to go about it was a dilemma. 
It was possible that Yvain could cast one of her search spells, but that would have to be a last resort. The sorceress needed to save her spell components and her energy to find the Pool of Twilight. I could have used the magic carpet to scout the area, Dale said, but she didn't need to say the obvious. The tattered remains of the carpet were tangled in the branches of a nearby tree, twenty feet above the ground. The magic carpet would fly no more. Gamaliel turned to Dale. Perhaps there is another way you might scout above the trees. There was a peculiar intensity in the barbarian's green-gold eyes. How? Dale asked wryly. Am I supposed to flap my arms and fly into the air? Perhaps. I mean just that, Ranger. Dale frowned. What was Gamaliel talking about? Gamaliel, Yvain said seriously. Are you certain this is wise? The barbarian shrugged. She must discover the gift someday, Yvain. Why not now, when it can be of use? Yvain looked skeptical, but did not disagree. Dale regarded them both in bewilderment. What are you talking about? Gamaliel reached out and took her hand. Come, I'll show you. He led her into the woods. Dale wondered why Yvain did not follow. Perhaps the sorceress needed to rest, she thought. Gamaliel stopped when they reached the edge of a steep precipice. Rugged, pristine wilderness stretched as far as Dale could see, forested ridges gilded by the morning light. The sight tugged at her heart. It was a feeling she had experienced before, hunting with her father or stalking orcs in the Valley of the Falls. A desire to make herself one with the forest, the mountains, and the sky. It is the wild gift, Gamaliel stated in answer to her thoughts. I don't understand, Dale said, shaking her head. I have sensed it in you, the barbarian explained in his rich voice. You move through the forest as if it is your home. You do not try to master it. Rather, you become part of it, sensing its sights and scents as if it is second nature for you. He laid both his strong hands on her shoulders. The wild gift runs in your blood, Dale. Do you choose to accept it? The barbarian's words sent a strange thrill through her. She wasn't at all certain what Gamaliel was talking about, but somehow she knew he spoke the truth. The wind blew his golden hair from his square, chiseled face. Yes, she whispered, before she really knew what she was saying. The wilderness did call to her. Gamaliel nodded, a pleased look in his eyes. Close your eyes, he said, leading her closer to the edge of the cliff. I will help you. She did as he instructed. Can you hear the wind? he murmured softly. Yes, she whispered. She could hear the voice of the morning breeze singing through the ghost-pale aspen trees. Listen to its music, Gamaliel instructed. Let it blow over you and through you. Now breathe, breathe deeply. What do you smell? The forest, Dale answered. Though her eyes were shut, she felt acutely aware of everything around her. I can smell the sun warming the granite of the cliff. There's a wolverine's den nearby, and a group of white-tailed deer even closer. 
I can smell snowcrest growing beside a frozen spring not far behind us. The Meliel nodded in satisfaction. Good, Dale. Now let yourself be a part of all that you sense. Let the wind lift you from your body. Let it shape you into something new, something wondrous. At first, it was improbable. Dale felt so human, so rooted to the ground. But gradually, she began to lighten, to feel as if the morning wind was flowing through her. And suddenly, she felt different indeed. That's it, Dale, Gamaliel whispered intently. Let the wilderness influence you. There is something within you trying to break out, to answer the call. Let yourself be free. Yes, be free, Dale said to herself. Exultation washed through her. The sounds and scents of the woodlands were overpowering, intoxicating. She felt as if she was falling through the air. Open your eyes, Dale Red Fletching! Gamaliel's shout sounded oddly distant. Dale opened her eyes. Wonder filled her. She was flying! She stretched her wings, feeling the air rush over her feathers. She laughed for joy, and the sound came out as the high, piercing cry of a hawk. She beat her wings, soaring on an updraft, and wheeled high in the sky. She saw Gamaliel below her, shading his eyes with a hand as he grinned up at her. Then, in a flash, the barbarian was gone and the tawny great cat was bounding through the forest. She followed him, marveling at the way her wings guided her on the swirling currents of air. Her sharp eyes caught glimpses of Gamaliel, loping gracefully among the trees below, and she pumped her wings, easily keeping pace with him. A silver lake flashed beneath her and for a moment she caught a glimpse of a red-gold hawk with red bands on the tips of its wings. It was only after a moment that she realized it was a reflection of herself. Rainbow-sided trout leaped in the cold water. She had the urge to swoop down and snatch one in her outstretched talons, but Gamaliel's snarl caught her attention. She flew after him. Her vision amazed her. She could see a mouse cowering under a pile of dead leaves and the gossamer strands of a spider's web glistening in a tree a league away. She wheeled gracefully in the azure sky. In moments, she saw them. Four travelers just breaking camp in a forested bowl a few leagues to the south. There was Kern, saddling his horse, and Listel and Miltiades packing their gear. There was another with them, an old man Dale did not recognize, but by the scales of justice engraved on the hilt of his sword, she knew him to be a venerable paladin. She cried out, letting Gamaliel know that she had seen them. The cat bounded back toward camp, and Dale followed. Moments later, she swooped down and perched on a branch near Yvain. She began to explain that she had seen Kern. The sorceress regarded her curiously. I can't understand hawk speech very well, Dale, Yvain said dryly. Could you try common, please? Suddenly the branch beneath Dale buckled. She fell to the ground with a thump. It would probably be better if you landed on the ground next time before transforming back into human form, Gamaliel noted as he shifted back into his barbarian shape and stepped into the clearing. 
Dale nodded in agreement as she stood, rubbing her sore backside. Quickly, she relayed to Evane what she had seen, and they hastily broke camp. If they marched swiftly, they might intercept their friends by noon. Once they were on their way, her head reeled. Had it not been for Gamaliel's strong grip on her arm, Dale might have tripped and fallen as the full implications of what happened washed over her. Gamaliel, she began hesitantly, how, how did I do that? As I told you, he said gravely, it is the wild gift, a legacy from Celia, your druidess mother. She had the gift, as many druids do, though I do not think it ran so strongly in her blood as yours. Gamaliel smiled, then his face grew solemn. It is a remarkable talent, Dale. But you must take care. Sometimes, sometimes those whose blood sings with the wild gift can become lost in it. The call of the wilderness becomes so overpowering, it drowns out all other thoughts and desires. Dale shivered. She thought she knew what he meant. Always remember, Dale, that when you become a hawk, you must lock a part of yourself away in a corner of your mind, a part that remembers what it is to be a human. What would happen if I didn't? she asked. Then... You would forget you were once a woman, and you would become a hawk forever. With that, Gamaliel moved swiftly through the trees after Evane. Dale hesitated a moment and followed, thinking of the way her hunt for creatures of evil had nearly consumed her in the Valley of the Falls. For those three days after burying Rin, she had thought of nothing but the hunt, as if she were an animal. She had lost herself, she knew now. She shivered. I will never forget that I am human, she whispered fiercely. Never again. She hurried to catch up with the sorceress and barbarian. The crystal resting in Evane's brazier flared brightly, then flashed into dust. Her locating spell was complete. The sorceress's eyes flew open. I found it! She stood, weakly. The sun was fast sinking toward the western mountains, and the companions had made camp in a grove of ancient fir trees. The pool of twilight? Kern asked, unconsciously gripping the haft of the hammer of Tyre. No, Kern, she means the button she lost from her tunic last ten day, Listel replied, rolling her eyes. Despite the elves' usual flippant humor, her delicate face was wan and tight. Evane sat on a log near the crackling campfire. She, Gamaliel, and Dale had found Kern and the others on a windswept pass around midday. The reunion had been a joyous one. It had been good to see that Kern and Listel were well, and Meltiades. There had also been a new introduction, but Evane found that she was already enjoying Trooper's company, as well as the old paladin's tongue, which was as sharp as his rune sword and wielded with similar dexterity. Yes, Kern, the pool of twilight, Evane said. She threw a handful of crystal dust into the campfire. The flames flared higher, an image appearing within. A pinnacle of dark stone with a distinctive cloven summit was revealed. At its base was the dark opening of a cave. Always before, the mountains interfered with my locating spell. 
but this time we are finally close enough. I have a solid fix on it. This spire is located in a valley no more than a dozen leagues from here, and the pool of twilight lies beneath. But, but what, Yvain? Miltiades asked when the sorceress paused. Her face turned grim. This time, when I detected the pool, I sensed a dangerous change in it. The guardian Shal and I encountered was no longer there. Instead, there was a new presence, one even more evil than the last. Serana, Kern growled. Yvain nodded. Yes, it could be that she controls the pool now. Kern stood regarding the others. You should stay here. Tomorrow, I'll journey to the valley alone. After all, it's the hammer she wants to get her hands on. I'll confront her in the cave and... And get burned to a crisp, son, Trooper snorted. The old paladin's eyes flashed like steel against stone. I don't know where you got the notion that foolishness is akin to heroism but you would do well to use that hammer of yours to knock the idea out of your head. He tugged at his beard in agitation. Go to the pool alone. You might as well hand this Serana the hammer on a silver platter. Fine lot of good your heroics would do us. Serana would have the hammer. You'd end up in a pile of ashes, and I'd have been wasting my time trying to turn you into a real paladin. He poked a bony finger at Kern's breastplate. And I don't have much time to waste anymore. Kern stared at the paladin, much chastened. What Trooper means to say, Kern, Miltiades went on in a more gentle tone, is that we are all in this quest together, and that as a group... We are stronger than any one of us alone. Trooper opened his mouth to point out that this was not at all what he had meant, but a glare from Miltiades' empty eye sockets snapped his mouth shut. He didn't suppose there was much point in arguing with a dead man. It was settled. The company of seven would set out for the pool together. And with any luck, they would reach it by late tomorrow. Suddenly, the westering light of the sun dimmed as a shadow passed overhead. All looked up to see a vast creature of darkness soaring high over the mountains. A black dragon. Kern had seen a dragon once before, and at the time he had thought it a magnificent and fearsome sight. But that worm had been little more than an overgrown lizard with wings, compared to the gigantic bat-winged creature that blotted out the sun now. The beast soared on the wind, stretching its long, sinuous neck, as if it flew with great purpose. In moments, it disappeared behind a mountain and was lost to sight. This is an ill omen, Trooper muttered. You don't think Serana could have summoned it, do you? Listel asked Yvaine. The sorceress shook her head. I don't know. If she did, then we might as well pack up and go home now, Trooper grumbled. I recognize that dragon from Legends. Its name is Dusk. And there isn't a black dragon in all the Northlands as big, as powerful, and as evil. He scratched his beard thoughtfully. Where do you suppose it was going? Dale asked wishing the beast had flown close enough to make a target for her arrows. She considered transforming into her hawk shape to pursue it. It was tempting, but no. That would be a fool's errand. She shook the thought from her head. It flies south, Gamaliel growled. Flan was all Kern said. Miltiades kept watch in the night. He stood on a low spur of granite, thirty paces from the sleeping figures huddled around the campfire. 
he knew that the preternatural chill he eternally emanated only added to the winter cold. It was hard enough for the others to get warm as it was. He did not wish to compound the problem. Besides, he did not need the fire to warm his bones, nor the light to see. Although, sometimes he did miss the companionship. But it was not his fate to make friends. Tyre had raised him once more from the grave for one purpose only, to see Flan restored. He knew this should gratify him, but he felt a hunger deep in his bones all the same. There was so much in the life he had lived long ago that remained unfulfilled. Once, he had been steward and protector of the city of Tyrell. For long years the city dwelled in peace. Then an evil wizard called Zarl set his sights upon it. Again and again Miltiades and the folk of Tyrell were forced to turn back Zarl's magical hordes. Yet the wizard himself never rode into battle. Thus, he always survived to raise another army of darkness. Finally, Miltiades decided to take by stealth what he was denied in honorable battle. He stole into Zarl's camp and slew the wizard. But in turn, Miltiades was discovered and slain by the wizard's servants. Then the evil horde marched to Tyrell, taking the city apart stone by stone. For a thousand years, Miltiades had lain in his tomb shunned by his god Tyre for his dishonorable act. Then, some twenty-two years ago, Tyre had raised the paladin from the grave, giving him a chance to redeem himself. His quest was to restore the city of Flan. After he had helped rescue the city from its imprisonment beneath the Red Wizard's tower, Miltiades had returned to a more peaceful slumber in his crypt. But his mission was not over. Flan would never truly be restored until the Hammer of Tyre was returned. Thus Tyre had raised him once again to aid Kern on his quest to return the Hammer to Flan. Now that quest was finally near an end, for good or ill. Either way, Miltiades knew he would return to the grave once more, this time forever. Yet vows he had made in life went unkept. Even though Torell's stones had long since turned to dust, the vows still bound him. He had sworn to protect the powerful secrets concealed beneath the city of Torell. True, the city was no more, and the hidden chambers might never be found. But then again, some unlucky being might stumble upon them tomorrow, and then the entire continent of Faerun would be in peril. If only I had more time, Miltiadi said softly to the knight. To make certain, the secrets are safe. What secrets, Miltiades? A voice asked gently. He turned to see a figure step out of the shadows. Long hair glistened in the moonlight. Evane. Her green eyes regarded him intelligently. Slowly he shook his head. Old secrets, Evane. Secrets that are, no doubt, long buried and lost forever. I should not concern myself with them, but sometimes it is hard for the dead to forget what they did in life, even if it is no longer important. Yvain gave him a thoughtful look. If it concerns you, Miltiades, I somehow doubt that it is truly unimportant. She took a step closer to him, suddenly aware that his bony visage must glow lividly in the moonlight. He reached up to lower his visor. Don't, she said. He halted, then nodded. As you wish. Perhaps 
It is best. This way you will see me for what I am. Yvain crossed her arms against the cold, laughing softly. I know very well what you are, Miltiades. A man of great strength and greater gentleness. A man fierce in battle, but kinder than he is fierce. And above all, a man with wisdom enough to see his own weaknesses and to forgive the weaknesses he sees in others. Her words surprised him. For a moment, he almost felt a spark of warmth inside his empty ribcage. But no, that was impossible. I always hoped that some day I would meet a man like you, Miltiades, she went on softly. She shook her head ruefully. I just forgot to hope that he would be alive when I did. I'm sorry, he said. It was all he could think of to say. She gave him a sharp look. I've told you once not to be sorry, Miltiades. I'll say it again. Don't be. She sighed, brushing her long hair from her face. You have your vows to keep, and I have mine. I don't suppose there's much room for anything else in our lives. He nodded in understanding. The two stood in silence for a long while, gazing into the night. When Yvain saw a shooting star, she didn't even think to make a wish. Chapter 18 The Forces of Twilight Anton stood atop the Temple of Tyre's highest rampart in the steely light of pre-dawn, gazing into the distance. He was watching and waiting. Three hours earlier, Sister Sindara had woken him in the deep of night. This is the day our fate will be decided, the ancient priestess had whispered in the chilly darkness. At those words, dread had clutched Anton's heart, but he had pushed the feeling aside. Quickly, he had donned his robe and hurried into the temple's main hall, striking a bronze gong to wake the other clerics. In the dark before the dawn, he told his brothers and sisters of Sindara's warning. In the hours since, the clerics of Tyre had done what they could to ready themselves and the temple for the coming onslaught, whatever form it might take. As Anton watched, the baleful eye of the sun heaved itself above the frozen plains, spilling its bloody light across the city. Gazing into the west, he saw a dark stain spreading across the horizon. Even as he watched, the thing grew larger, a vast undulating sea approaching the city's walls. His sharp eyes could just make out the twisted forms that shambled in the fore of the black tide. Zombies, Anton murmured, an army of zombies. He did not hesitate. He lifted a polished silver-tipped ox horn that hung from a strap about his neck and sounded a long, clear note. The alarm rang out across the city. As it did, the scene erupted in chaos. Folk streamed into the streets. Word of the approaching army of doom had spread like wildfire. Now people shoved past each other in an effort to flee the city. Those who fell in the crush of humanity were trampled and did not get up. In years past, the valiant folk of Flan would have armed themselves for battle, Today they poured out of the city's western gate and fled into the countryside. Only a few remained behind, and these were mostly thieves and looters. By the time the zombies neared the death gates, the city was virtually empty. The massive, iron-bound death gates had been called by many names in the past. Fire Dragon Gates, Ogre's Bane Gates, Giant's doom gates. But finally, 
they had simply come to be called the Death Gates, for again and again armies of evil had broken and perished against them. But not this time. Rusted and worm-eaten, the Death Gates had decayed along with the rest of the city, and no one had bothered to repair them. As the throng of zombies surged forward, the huge gates groaned. More zombies pressed against them, and more, trampling each other to pulp as they pushed at the portal. Finally, the death gates exploded in a spray of rotting timber. Zombies streamed into the abandoned city. Those thieves who had chosen to linger behind and fill their pockets soon regretted their decision as they were torn limb from limb. In minutes, all of Flan was awash with zombies. Only one bastion of resistance remained, and it was upon this that the army of undead finally converged. The Temple of Tyre. As he watched the zombie horde approach, Anton found himself wondering for the hundredth time how the Hammer Seeker and his companions fared. But there was no way to know. Sindara's runestones had revealed nothing. They could only hope that Kern was even now on his way back to the city. It was their only chance. If the temple fell before the hammer was returned, Flan would be wiped off the face of Toril forever. Help us, Tyre, Anton muttered in prayer. Help us to hold on. Six other clerics ascended the walls to stand beside Anton. Below, Tarl led a dozen more clerics in the chants that lent magical strength to the gray stone walls and the huge iron gates. At last, the horde of undead reached the temple, filling the air with their foul reek. Anton gazed at the attackers in horror. He had seen corpses raised from the grave before, and though the sight had been unpleasant, it was nothing compared to the throng of abominations he saw before him now. These zombies were mockeries of living beings, fused from the disparate pieces of myriad creatures as if they had been pasted together by a madman. A snarling elf, possessing arms that ended not in hands, but in the snapping heads of vipers. An undead lion, with the rotting upper bodies of three bow-wielding halflings protruding from its back. A gigantic spider, its head that of a beautiful, pale-skinned woman. But its eyes the mindless, many-faceted orbs of an insect. And still more and worse, that made Anton sick even to look. In the name of Tyre, return to the graves that spawned you, creatures of evil. Anton boomed, raising his arms above his head. The six clerics flanking him followed suit. Shimmering blue light glowed about their fingertips. A score of zombies in the lead abruptly collapsed into heaps of dust, destroyed by the holy power of Tyre. But more zombie abominations lurched forward to take the place of those that had been eliminated. Come, clerics of Tyre, a goblin fused to the backs of a decomposing wolf crackled with a dirty grin. Come join us. Why do you resist? A mold-covered woman with scorpion tails for hair called in a syrupy voice. If you fight us, you will perish, and then your bodies will be fused to ours. Whether you resist or not, inevitably you will join us. A cacophony rose from the surging throng. Join us! Join to us! Join us! Anton gagged in revulsion. Let Tyre's power strengthen you, he called to the clerics beside him. All raised their arms once more, calling down the holy wrath of their god. Again, an entire rank of zombies exploded into clouds of choking dust. Still more shambled forward, jeering at the clerics of Tyre. 
Again, Anton and the six clerics beside him summoned Tyre's power to destroy the slavering undead. And still again, one of the clerics collapsed in exhaustion, but the others chanted on, sending their prayers to Tyre. Fifty more undead burst into foul-smelling dust before another two clerics crumpled into unconsciousness. Utterly drained from the effort of channeling so much magical energy. In the end, Anton alone stood upon the rampart to call on Tyre's power. It was a measure of his willpower that a dozen more zombies exploded into yellow splinters. Anton felt his knees give way. He slumped to the battlement, gasping for breath. He and his comrades had destroyed fully ten score zombies, but more had appeared to take their place, and the horde stretched through the city streets as far as the eye could see. Out the death gates and to the distant horizon, a great, writhing, fearsome stain upon the land. Strengthen the gates, he shouted down hoarsely. Tarl was ready. Tire! Grant us the power of your protection, the white-haired cleric called out in a ringing voice. A dozen clerics chanted fervent prayers. Suddenly, massive columns of jagged stone began to push up out of the ground before the gates, growing like gigantic trees. In moments, a dozen columns towered in front of the gates, bolstering the portals. As the first zombies approached, spikes shot out of the columns like huge stony thorns impaling the undead creatures. The zombies writhed on the spikes, shredding their own rotting flesh with their struggles. Blue lightning crackled around their bodies, burning them to cinders. More zombies lurched mindlessly toward the gates. They, too, were impaled by the huge stone thorns and consumed by holy fire. Still more followed suit. The clerics chanted on. As one tired, slumping to his knees, another stepped forward to take his or her place. Through it all, Tarl's voice never faltered. The zombies continued their mindless advance, letting out inhuman screams as the spikes rent their undead flesh and lightning coursed through their bodies, streaming out of their wounds and blankly staring eyes. The clerics chanted on, their voices growing ragged. Suddenly, the mass of zombies parted before the gate. A huge fire giant strode through their ranks. His undead body was whole, but instead of eyes, in each socket was lodged the head of a dwarf. Screaming orders, the dual dwarf heads directed the lumbering body of the giant. The towering giant gripped two of the columns in its enormous hands. A dozen spikes shot out, piercing the giant's hands. Holy magic crackled along the length of the monster's arms. Flesh sizzled and bubbled, filling the air with its stench. But the magic was not enough. The giant's arms tensed. The two columns shattered in a spray of stone, clearing a space before the gate. The giant reached out, gripping the top of the iron portal. Tarl, hearing the collapse, cried, Louder, clerics of Tyre! But this time, their chants were to no avail. The fire giant grunted. The dual dwarf heads shrieked orders. The monster's muscles bulged until they seemed ready to burst. Suddenly, the sound of rending metal shattered the air. Shards of iron flew in all directions. The gates were sundered. The clerics of Tyre stared in horror as the fire giant stepped through. The dwarf heads in its eye sockets laughing evilly. Even then, Tarl Destania stood strong. He could see the magically animated zombie clearly. 
In one swift move, he hurled his warhammer. It spun through the air and struck the giant directly between its hideous dwarf eyes. The fire giant's head exploded in a spray of rotting meat. It tottered and fell backward, crushing dozens of zombies to pulp beneath its bulk. Retreat to the temple, Tarl shouted. Hastily, the clerics retreated, hauling Anton and the others who had collapsed back with them. What of you, brother, Tarl? Sister Sindara called out when it became clear that Tarl did not intend to budge from the twisted wreckage of the gates. My place is here, the white-haired cleric said fiercely. The old priestess only nodded, understanding in her dark eyes. She dashed into the temple with the others. Hurry, Kern, Tarl whispered softly, hoping somehow, somewhere, his son could hear him. Wherever you are, you must hurry. As the zombies rushed forward, jabbering with wicked glee, Tarl held up a single hand. By Tyre, none shall pass. Suddenly, a shining wall of transparent blue fire appeared, sealing the gaping breach in the temple's wall. The zombies recoiled from it. They could not pass through the holy light. Tarl clenched his jaw, concentrating. Despite the cold, sweat beaded on his furrowed brow, rolling in rivulets down his face. He could feel Tyre's strength flowing through him like liquid fire. A strange elation began to fill him. A fierce grin spread across his face. His days of self-pity and mourning were gone. All that mattered was his belief in Tyre and in justice. By all the gods of light, shall... Tarl shouted inwardly, I will not give up. Somehow I will hold on. Zombies shrieked in rage as by the dozens they tried to pass through the gates and perished. The magical barrier did not waver. Tarl's faith sustained him against their onslaught. But gradually, the fire in his blood burned hotter and hotter. Inside the temple's portico, Anton staggered weakly to his feet. He gazed between the marble columns. Awe filled him at what he saw. How long, how long do you think he can hold the wall? He asked in hoarse amazement. Until the magic consumes him, Sister Sindara answered sharply and he dies. Kern and his companions were up with the cold gray dawn. Dale drew her previously miniaturized mount from a pocket and set it on the ground. Miltiades' white stallion breathed on the figurine, and instantly Dale's roan mare was snorting and pawing at the ground. Unfortunately, Yvain and Gamaliel were without mounts. I can run as swiftly as any horse, Gamaliel said with a laugh. Shimmering, his body remolded itself into his feline form. It was Listel who came up with a solution for Yvain. The elf gave her horse to the sorceress, while she herself rode behind Trooper on Lancer's broad back. This was much to the elder paladin's chagrin, however for it was clear after the first mile that Listel was a definite saddle hog. All your squirming is going to make me sick, he growled to the elven illusionist. Can't you sit still? No, she replied sweetly. The old paladin grunted in exasperation. Listel gave a smug smile and wriggled another inch forward on the saddle, claiming still more territory for herself. Trooper bent down and pretended to scratch his mount's ears. All right, Lancer, he whispered surreptitiously to the big stallion. 
I'll hold on to the saddle horn while you start kicking. Elves have very good ears, Trooper, Listel warned. The paladin hurriedly sat up straight, a guilty look on his face. Kern shook his head as he watched this exchange. He could almost believe that this was the old Listel he saw, unpredictable and lighthearted, smiling and joking as if she had never spoken of Safahir's tower or of what had happened to her there. Almost. Except that every once in a while, when she must have thought he wasn't looking, she would glance fleetingly in Kern's direction, sadness in her silvery eyes. You can't love an illusion, he muttered softly to himself. Gods, you can't even get a grip on one. He shook his head, trying to clear it. He couldn't think about Listel, not now. He had to be ready to face Serana at the pool. All morning they made slow progress, ascending a narrow pass between knife-edged peaks, breaking trail through deep drifts of soft, powdery snow. The wind at the summit whipped at them cruelly, and they quickly descended the other side of the pass, riding into a deep valley. Are we nearing the pinnacle of stone, Yvain? Miltiades asked, as the sun began its westward trek. The paladin rode close to the sorceress. I think so, she replied. I would know for certain if I could get a look above the trees. I think I can arrange something. Dale said a bit mysteriously. Without explanation, the ranger wheeled her horse around and quickly disappeared among the trees. Kern exchanged a curious glance with the others. Scant minutes later, Dale caught up with the group. Her cheeks were flush, and she seemed slightly out of breath. I got a glimpse of the spire, she said excitedly. It's no more than an hour's ride ahead. Kern gave the ranger a piercing look. How do you know, Dale? I, I found a pile of boulders and climbed them, she said. But this didn't ring true. However, no one pressed the question. Before long, the sun slipped behind a mountain, casting a premature gloom over the forest. Finally, the pines gave way to rolling alpine tundra and they espied the pinnacle of stone. It loomed above them, a foreboding sentinel. At the base of the natural basalt spire was a grove of what appeared to be dark, leafless oak trees. But there was something unnatural about the grove. I can see through the trees, Listel exclaimed in surprise. Can't you feel it? Dale asked, shuddering. They're not living trees at all. They're shadows. Dark echoes of the trees that used to grow there, she swore fiercely. An abomination. It is the magic of the twilight pool, Yvain explained. It pervades the very ground here, perverting all it touches. We must be careful. Kern drew the hammer from his belt. At least there are no monsters here to block our way. You're awfully sure of yourself, Trooper noted cuttingly. Do you see any monsters? Kern asked in exasperation. No, but that's not the point. Trooper scratched his grizzled beard thoughtfully. I remember a man who might not have been as eager as you to ride into that grove. Kern groaned. I know you're trying to help, Trooper, but this isn't really the time for one of your long-winded stories. Nonsense, the old paladin snorted. It's the perfect time. This fellow I'm thinking of was a veteran warrior before you were even a mischievous whim in your parents' minds. One day, we were riding across the stone land some leagues to the east of here, when we saw a huge white fortress perched high on a hill. I asked him what he thought of the place. He said to me, 
Well, it's white on this side. Paladin paused, apparently waiting for Kern's reaction. I don't understand, Kern said with a frown. Don't jump to conclusions, lad. Trooper's bushy eyebrows bristled as if for emphasis. That's what it means. Believe what your eyes tell you, but only what they tell you and no more. Kern nodded, realizing his foolhardiness. It seemed there was still much to being a paladin that he had yet to learn. But there was no more time. They had reached the pool. He would just have to do his best to remember the lessons Trooper had taught him these last days, and hope he had learned enough. The riders dismounted. On foot, they crossed the gray, snow-dusted tundra to the shadow-filled grove of trees. Yvain paused, shutting her eyes and spreading her arms wide. She winced, a flicker of pain crossing her brow. I can feel the power of the pool emanating from among the trees, she said hoarsely. The entrance to the cavern is somewhere in the grove. They stepped among the twisted shadow trees. I can still feel the suffering, Dale murmured. Everything that perished here did so in great pain. Gloom filled the air. Kern could see no more than a dozen paces ahead in the murk. The trees seemed to close in behind him with disconcerting swiftness. It was almost as if the trees had moved to block their escape, Kern thought. He quickly discarded the unpleasant notion. Trooper pulled out an oil-soaked torch and flint and tinder to light it. I wouldn't do that, Yvain hissed. The old paladin froze, then nodded. You're right. I doubt they much care for fire. Whom do you speak of? Miltiades asked, but Trooper did not answer. They continued on. Listel looked around nervously, her eyes growing wider by the minute. She began to turn her head this way and that. It felt as if someone or something was creeping up from behind them. She felt sure of it. The sensation grew stronger with each passing step. There's something behind us, she whispered hoarsely. Get hold of yourself, Trooper growled. There is magic at work here. Fear lingers on the air, but you have to resist it. We're only as strong as our weakest link. If you succumb, Listel, we're all lost. She nodded silently, clenching her jaw. She did her best to push the fear from her mind. It wasn't easy, but if the others could manage, she could as well. A rough, natural wall of stone loomed before them in the gray air. A jagged opening yawned like a gigantic maw. Yvain did not need to say that this was the entrance to the pool. The attack came without warning. A ring of shadow trees closed around them, swinging dark limbs ending in sharp broken branches. Kern was knocked from his feet and fell hard to the earth. A tree plucked Dale off the ground. The ranger screamed as she struggled to free herself, but more and more branches snaked out to grip her. A dozen branches reached for Miltiades. He swung at them with his sword, his blade passing right through the shadow substances of the trees. Quickly, he scrambled out of their reach. Yvain chanted the words of a spell. A ball of green lightning appeared in her hand, which she hurled at a knot of shadow trees. The lightning expanded as it flew through the air. It struck the approaching trees dead on, bursting in a brilliant spray of emerald sparks. The shadow trees marched on, unaffected. Let her go, Kern shouted, gaining his feet and charging the tree that held Dale. He swung the hammer at its trunk. Like Miltiadi's sword, it passed right through the immaterial substance of the tree. 
How can we fight shadows? Trooper cried. He, too, was having no luck with his sword, and Gamaliel's claws proved no more effective against the shadow trees. I have an idea, Listel shouted. Everyone, hold your weapons high! Kern didn't know what the elf intended, but there was no time to question her. The circle of trees was tightening around them. He raised the hammer of Tyre into the air. Trooper and Miltiades did likewise with their weapons. Listel moved her hands in an intricate pattern. Suddenly, all three of the upraised weapons shimmered with magical fire. Now, give them a try, she said with a grin. Miltiades turned to an approaching tree. He swung his sword, cleaving an outstretched branch in two. The tree recoiled in agony, the severed branch smoking. With a cry, Kern hurled himself at the tree that held Dale captive. His blow landed squarely on its trunk. The shadow tree shuddered as crimson flame licked up its dark surface. It still did not let go of Dale. Kern swore. The flames would consume her along with the tree. Dale, you've got to break free, he cried. I can't, she struggled frantically to no avail. The flames leaped higher until Dale was lost to sight. Kern staggered backward in horror as the tree toppled to the ground. In moments, the flames died down and vanished. There was nothing left of the shadow tree. Dale sat on the ground, unhurt, a puzzled expression on her face. How, how, she began. It's illusionary fire, Listel called out in explanation. Suddenly, Kern understood the logic. Illusionary fire to burn shadow trees, he said in amazement. How did you guess, Listel? She regarded him with a strange expression. I'm an expert on illusions, aren't I, Kern? He did not have time to reply. Cold, misty branches clutched at him from behind. He whirled around, hammer blazing, and another tree was turned into flaming splinters. With the help of Listel's magical fire, Kern, Miltiades, and Trooper made quick work of the rest of the shadow trees. At last the grove was silent. If the remaining trees were capable of fighting, they were less willing to try now. Kern drew in a deep breath of relief. They had survived the first test. This cannot be, Serana shrieked. She stood upon a small spur of rock in the center of the pool of twilight, her body was completely obscured now by the brilliant metallic flecks that swirled madly beneath her skin. But she neither noticed nor cared. She watched an image in the surface of the pool. Kern and his wretched band of friends had just slain her beautiful tree shadows. How dare they defy me! She screamed once more, her voice resounding through the vast cavern. For the first time since becoming guardian of the pool, she felt a pang of anxiety. She had believed her power to be invincible. Could it be that these fools truly presented a threat to her? They will not defeat me, she snarled. I will have my revenge and the hammer of Tyre. Then I will become a goddess but perhaps she needed some help. Yes, that was it. Why hadn't she thought of getting help sooner? There was one in particular who could help her defeat the paladin puppy and his band of idiots. In fact, he would have no choice but to aid her. She cast her mind forth, using the power of the pool to send forth a summons, a summons that could not be refused. When that was done, she turned her thoughts to a plan. She needed something else out of the ordinary to neutralize the invaders. But what? Suddenly, 
a gleaming tendril of water lifted itself from the pool, bearing a staff of dull silver. Serana laughed. Ah, yes, the staff of twilight. The pool knew her very thoughts. She reached out and grasped the throbbing staff. Now she had everything she needed. Dusk alighted on the high crag, spreading its wide midnight black wings. A thousand dragons filled the huge valley that stretched before him. For three days he had flown the length and breadth of the moon sea, using the power Serana had granted him from the pool to rally the evil dragons. Black, blue, red, and green, he sought them all in their lairs, deep in dank caves and perched on mountain heights. The magic of the twilight pool lent power to his words, and it had been simple to fan the sparks of hatred each dragon bore in its heart for humankind. Hear me now, my brothers and sisters, Dusk trumpeted, his voice thundering throughout the valley. The second dragon rage is nigh. We shall drive the humans from their homes. We shall slay them to the last. And then we will plunder their cities of treasure. Each of you will gain a hoard of gold, such as a king only dreams of. And Dusk added to himself, I will have a hundred times that many riches, a treasure such as Fair Run has never known. He smiled toothily, immensely pleased. None could hold the feeblest candle to his majesty. He was the most powerful dragon in all the Northlands, and the others recognized his stature. But he was more than simply the strongest of his kind. He was their ruler, the emperor of dragons. Dusk opened his many-fanged maw, ready to send out the order that would bring the dragon soaring into the sky in a deadly rainbow of color the order that would begin the second dragon rage. At last, he would have his long-awaited revenge against that wretched city of Flan, and against all humankind. Suddenly, a voice pierced his mind. Come to me, Dusk. I have need of you. Dusk froze. No, this could not be. He felt something clutch at his essence, as if his heart were a puppet on a string. I will not, Serana, Dusk shrieked. Flecks of twilight swirled wildly in his one good eye. Heed my call, Dusk. You cannot resist. No, he screamed. Stones all around shattered at the furious pitch of his voice, but his wings had already started to beat, lifting him from the crag. His blood burned in his veins. It was as if he were a fish caught on a fisherman's line, slowly being reeled in. He tried to resist the pull, but it was too strong, too overpowering. The magical power he had accepted bound him inexorably to the pool. Curse you, Serana! You will pay for this! Finally, he could resist no longer. Silver sparks blazing in his eyes, he soared high into the air, streaking toward the pool of twilight. Below him, the evil dragons let out a roar of anger and confusion. Their leader was abandoning them. Without his influence, glorious thoughts of gold and human cities in flame evaporated from their minds. Their individual suspicious and greedy natures returned. 
Those that did not wheel to attack the dragons nearest to them immediately leaped into the air and sped back to their lairs to jealously guard their private hordes. The second dragon rage was over before it had begun. The seven adventurers stood before the gaping entrance of the cave. Be ready, Yvain warned. For what? Listel asked with a gulp. Anything, the sorceress replied. Listel sighed. I was afraid that was what you were going to say. Kern led the way into the dark tunnel, the others following close behind. There was no hope of catching Serana by surprise. The attack of the shadow tree showed that she was all too aware of their presence. Their only hope was to distract her long enough so that Yvaine could cast her spell to destroy the pool. How exactly they were going to do that, no one could say. Kern held the hammer of Tyre aloft before him. The weapon gave off a faint blue light, but the darkness seemed to smother the illumination. He could see no more than a few scant feet before him. The tunnel wound down into the pitch darkness. The air grew stuffier. Soon Kern was sweating inside his armor. It was growing difficult to breathe. There was no warning when the floor suddenly yawned beneath them. Kern screamed as he plummeted through jet blackness. He heard the cries of the others around him, heard their voices echoing off stone, but he could no longer see them. Dank air whipped wildly past him. The cries of the others were cut short. Kern felt himself become entangled in a mass of something sticky and rubbery. Then he hit the ground. He lay stunned for long minutes. Then, dizzily, he pulled himself to his feet. A dim gray light sprang to life around him. He could see that his armor was covered with sticky blue cobwebs. That meant someone had tried to use. His head snapped up. He stood at the edge of a dull, metallic-looking pool of water in the center of a vast cavern. He gasped when he saw his companions suspended in the air twenty feet above the pool, struggling futilely against invisible bonds that gripped them. A form stood on a rock in the center of the pool, holding a gleaming staff. At first, the being's outline was obscured by the bright sparks of twilight that swirled within its flesh. Then, with a surge of fury, Kern recognized the being. Yes, Kern, it is I, Serana's voice sneered. Welcome to the Pool of Twilight. Chapter 19 Twilight Falls I wouldn't do that if I were you, Paladin, Serana's voice leered as Kern raised the hammer of Tyre. He hesitated. Serana's wings fluttered. She waved her silvery staff, and Kern's friends danced in the air above the pool like puppets on strings. Dale was thrashing like a caged animal, while Trooper muttered a stream of curses. Miltiades and Gamaliel were having no better luck than the venerable paladin. The magical trap was too strong, even for those two most powerful warriors. Unable to use their hands, Neither Yvain nor Listel could cast any spell, but the invisible bonds did not prevent Listel from tossing a few choice insults down at Serana. The half-fiend ignored the elves' imaginative taunts. Strike me with that precious hammer of yours, Kern, and you're going to ruin this useful staff as well. If you destroy the Staff of Twilight... Your beloved friends will plunge into my pool. The steely waters sucked and gurgled hungrily about the rock in the pool's center. And when they do, Paladin, 
They'll be fused with zombie corpses that wait in the pool's depths, ready to help your friends turn into creatures of darkness. Serana raised her gnarled arms exultantly. Now that would be a sight worth seeing. The lovely sorceress Evane sprouting from the back of a decomposing troll, <laughs> recruited into my zombie army. <laughs> Serana's eyes flashed. Or perhaps you'd rather see what creatures I have ready to burrow into the flesh of the pretty little elf. She flicked the staff, and Listel screamed as she dropped a few inches, dangling closer to the perilous surface of the pool. With a growl, Kern lowered the hammer of tire. There is one way you can save your precious friends, Servana's all-pervasive voice cooed. Except for the one you call Miltiades. That vile metal can of moldering bones. There will be no saving that. That heinous defiler of my father's tower. I plan to grind that wretched skeleton to dust. Unseen magical hands shook Miltiades violently. His skeletal body rattled inside his armor, though his ever-stoic expression did not waver. However... I will free the others, even the treacherous sorceress Evane, if you will do just one thing. Drop the hammer of Tyre into the pool. Kern scowled, gritting his teeth. He clenched the holy relic tightly. It was his destiny to return the hammer to Flan. He couldn't simply cast it into the pool. Yet if he did not, it looked as if his friends would die. Slowly, he extended the hammer out over the pool's edge. Kern, don't! Listel managed to cry out. Invisible bonds squeezed the elf, brutally silencing her. Do it, paladin! Kern clenched his jaw, loosening his grip. Thunder split the air. Jagged chunks of stone crashed to the cavern's floor as a hole burst open in the ceiling above. Something crashed through with a deafening noise. A vast black dragon. Kern froze in astonishment, realizing it was the beast trooper had called Dusk. The dragon circled menacingly. How have you forced me to return here, sorceress? The dragon hissed. The half-fiend laughed shrilly. Just because you are guardian of the pool no longer, and I am guardian in your place, does not mean your pact with the pool is broken. When you accepted the power I granted you, you also accepted shackles that bind you to me. You cannot ignore my call, Dusk. This cannot be! The dragon shrieked. Brilliant silver sparks danced in his one good eye. I was on the verge of sending a thousand evil dragons against the cities of the Moon Sea. The dragon rage was about to begin. Kern gasped as the beast whirled dangerously close to his friends. They bobbed up and down in the dragon's wake like leaves buffeted by the wind. Your petty dragon rage means nothing to me, Serana's voice snapped. I have need of you here. These vile creatures intend to destroy the pool of twilight. Without its magic, you wouldn't have the power of a garden snake, Dusk. Now obey my command. Kill these intruders for me. She pointed the staff directly at Kern and start with this puppy paladin. I am not your slave, the dragon bellowed. His vast wings propelled his sinuous body toward the cavern's ceiling. 
As long as I am guardian of the pool, you must obey me, Dusk. The dragon threw his head back, trumpeting his fury. Then you will die, sorceress, and command me no more. Dusk barked a magical word. Suddenly, a globe of impenetrable darkness sprang into being around the rock Serana stood upon. Folding his wings back against his scaly body, the dragon dove toward the inky sphere. At the same time, brilliant silver-gray streaks of magic from Serana's staff shattered the globe of darkness. Dusk accelerated his descent, extending his sickle-like claws. Serana waved a hand frantically, and a shimmering haze appeared around her an instant before the dragon struck. His blow glanced off the magical shield in a spray of sparks. With a bellow, he winged back toward the cavern's ceiling. Serana smiled smugly, but the force of the dragon's blow had managed to knock her off balance. She teetered on the edge of the rock, arms flailing, then she tumbled backward into the pool. The staff of twilight flew from her hand. Kern watched in horror as the staff tumbled and rolled. It stopped less than a hand span from the edge. Dale gasped. We're sinking, the ranger shouted. Kern looked up in horror. Sure enough, his six friends were all gradually descending toward the pool's surface. Can't one of you blasted spellcasters do something? Trooper snapped. I've already had my bath this year. Both Evane and Listel were powerless. Kern swore. Somehow he had to get that staff. The waters of the pool frothed angrily. Something began to rise out of the depths, something huge. Gray foam ran from its sides as it lifted higher and higher, reaching toward the cavern's heights. Serana. The gigantic, misshapen form of the half-fiend sorceress stood a full fifty feet high. Twilight-colored specks danced beneath her skin like stars gone mad. She reached out colossal arms. Fight me now, Wyrm! The dragon screamed and once again plummeted toward her. The companions could only watch in dread fascination as the two titans grappled with each other. They had their own troubles. Inch by inch, they continued to be lowered toward the surface of the pool. Dusk's claws raked Serana's body, and searing magic crackled through the dragon. The reek of burned flesh filled the cavern. Dusk ignored the pain. The dragon's snapping jaws closed on Serana's throat. The same moment, a dozen spikes of brilliant magic punched through Dusk's body like white-hot spears. Neither monster dared to lose its hold on the other as they began to sink. Locked in a fatal embrace, dragon and gigantic sorceress disappeared into the pool of twilight. The torpid waters closed over them with a gurgling sound, silencing their inhuman screams. A ripple spread across the pool's surface. Then all was still. Kern shook his head in amazement. Evil really does destroy itself, he thought. Now, to free his friends, who hovered only a few inches above the surface of the pool. Quickly, he shed his armor and stood on the edge of the basin. Are you insane, lad? Trooper growled. Maybe, Kern said with a grin. But there's only one way to find out. Ignoring the shouts of protest from his friends, he dove into the pool. The thick water closed about him, oily against his skin. He felt the pool's magic swirl around him, trying to penetrate its flesh to absorb his essence into its own. Suddenly, Kern was buoyed to the pool's surface by a mass of sticky blue cobwebs. 
His unmagic did protect him. He began swimming for the spur of rock in the pool's center. In truth, it was more like dragging himself through molasses than swimming. After several minutes of laborious effort, he made it to the rock. He pulled himself out of the pool, shaking off as many of the blue cobwebs as he could. Then, carefully, he picked up the Staff of Twilight. He realized then that he had absolutely no idea what to do with it. Uh, does anyone know how to work one of these things? He asked sheepishly. I don't really think we have time for lessons for beginners, Trooper commented acidly. He and the others were no more than a hand span above the silvery waters. You can do it, Kern, Evane said calmly. I'll help you. He nodded jerkily. Now, grip the staff tightly and concentrate on me, the sorceress instructed. Close your eyes and envision a thread running from my waist right to the staff. Now, begin reeling it in. Like a fishing rod? he asked. Exactly. Kern tried to do as she advised. His heart pounded in his chest. He knew he didn't have much time. He clenched his eyes tightly, concentrating. Something bumped into him. He windmilled his arms wildly to keep from falling off the rock. He opened his eyes to see Yvain standing near him at the edge of the pool. A little shaky, Kern, but not bad, she said with a smile. However, why don't you let me handle the others? He relinquished the staff only too gladly. Minutes later, transported by Yvain and the staff of Twilight, the adventurers stood together on solid ground. Kern had managed to scrape off most of the cobweb residue, but putting his armor back on was a sticky business. It is time to cast your spell, Yvain, Miltiades said gravely. You must destroy the pool. The sorceress was already preparing her incantation. She lit a fire in her small copper brazier, sprinkling a handful of dried herbs and unusual powders over the flame. Multicolored sparks crackled into the air. She sat cross-legged before the brazier, drawing out an oval crystal. She set it carefully in the fire's center. Immediately, the gym began to pulsate in rhythm with the flickering flames. I'm not certain how long this will take, Yvain explained to the others. I've never encountered a pool quite like this one before. The other pools I've destroyed have all been either purely dark or light in nature. As she talked, the sorceress deftly twisted her long hair into a knot to keep it out of the fire. But this pool is different. Its essence is... She struggled for the right words. Primal. Chaotic. Its source lies in a magic far older than that of other pools. A magic that comes from the time before light and dark were separate, and all the universe dwelt in twilight. Will you be able to destroy it, Yvain? Hearn asked solemnly. She laughed grimly. There's just one way to find out. She held her hands above the brazier and gem, chanting arcane words. Suddenly, her voice fell silent, and her green eyes stared blankly into space. The sorceress sat as if hewn of stone. She will be like this for some time, Gamaliel said, standing protectively behind Yvain. She cannot be disturbed, should anything wake her from her spell before it is complete, the gem will break, and she will die. By the fierce gleam in his eye, 
it was clear the barbarian man did not intend to allow such a mishap to occur. There was nothing to do then but wait. Kern sat down on a rock. Dale sighed, wandering a short distance from the others. She felt strangely let down. She had vowed to avenge her father's death. But Serana was dead, slain by the dragon, and the young ranger's arrows had played no part in it. The fire of revenge still smoldered in her heart. What of her oath now? She asked herself. How could she keep her word to her father? She rested her hands against the smooth wood of her magical bow. How much longer? Trooper asked Gamaliel with a scowl. The older paladin paced fretfully. The stone-faced barbarian shrugged. I am no sorcerer. I cannot say. What is it, Trooper? Listel asked in concern. The old man shook his head. I'm not certain. It's just that there's something about this place that bothers. A gurgling sound emanated from the pool, cutting off the old paladin. All turned to see the surface of the pool begin bubbling furiously. In a spray of foam, something began to lift from the roiling waters. A gigantic creature uncurled itself from the depths of the pool to tower above the companions. By tire above, Trooper whispered. For a scant moment, Kern wondered how Serana and Dusk could still be alive. Quickly, he realized the truth. They were dead enough. But the magic of the pool had fused their gigantic corpses into a hideous new undead form. The dragon's tattered wings sprouted from the back of the gigantic half-fiend, and her hands ended in his claws. Dusk's neck sprouted from the center of Serana's chest, his fanged maw snapping mindlessly. The creature took a lumbering step forward, wading through the pool. Its sinuous dragon tail snapped behind it like a huge deadly whip. Serana's dead eyes stared with blank malice. The pool of twilight finally possessed a guardian that it could utterly control. The dragon's maw opened wide. Beware, dragon breath, Trooper shouted. Hastily, Kern, Listel, and Dale dove out of the way. Gamaliel crouched protectively before Yvain, still deep in her spell. But a heartbeat later, Miltiades stepped between the barbarian and the creature of the pool. A black, acrid-smelling cloud issued from the dragon's mouth, gouging the stone floor and melting stalagmites into piles of slag. A spray of dark acid splattered against Miltiades' armor, pitting the hard steel. A few droplets flew past, burning into Gamaliel's flesh, but Yvain remained unhurt. That was all that mattered to the barbarian. The new guardian reached the edge of the pool. It could not leave the water that had spawned it and gave it continued strength. So the guardian reached high above with its gigantic arm and wrenched a huge stalactite from the cavern's ceiling. Dead eyes blazing, it hurled the sharp chunk of stone toward the adventurers. The stalactite narrowly missed Kern, striking the stone floor and bursting into splinters of rock that traced hot tracks across his exposed skin. He stood, bleeding from a dozen small wounds, Already the Guardian was reaching for another stalactite. Trooper and Miltiades rushed forward, and Kern sprang into motion. But almost immediately, the Guardian launched another stalactite. Kern raised his shield, doubting it would do much good against the crushing force of a half ton of solid limestone. Abruptly, a bright streak of light arced through the air, striking the stalactite in mid-flight. 
The chunk of stone veered off its deadly course and plunged into the pool. The guardian let out a piercing shriek of rage. Kern turned to see Listel clutching the staff of twilight. Its powers of levitation had diverted the stalactite from its deadly trajectory. Again and again, the zombie guard snapped off sharp-pointed stalactites and hurled them at the adventurers. Listel waved the staff vigorously, using its magic to turn the stones aside. Dale tried to launch arrows at the Guardian, but clouds of acid dragon breath burnt them to ashes before they could reach their target. Kern, Trooper, and Miltiades managed to creep within striking distance. When at last Kern was within range, he didn't hesitate. He hurled the hammer of Tyre directly at the Guardian's head. The weapon flashed with blue radiance as it spun through the air. Suddenly, a shimmering tentacle of metallic water snaked out of the pool, curling around the hammer. The liquid tentacle halted the weapon in mid-flight and began dragging it down into the murky depths. Quickly, Kern summoned the hammer back to his outstretched hand. It seemed the pool protected its guardian, even as the guardian protected the pool. How could he harm the creature if his hammer couldn't reach it? A stalactite struck unnervingly close to Kern and the two paladins. Listel, what's the matter? Miltiades called out. The elf bit her lip, shaking the staff of twilight. A thin tendril of smoke rose from its tip. I think this thing's had it, she said glumly, casting the spent staff aside. Well, you'll be able to say the same thing about us shortly if we don't do something about this blasted creature, Trooper snapped. He testily gathered his gray robe around his knobby knees to dodge a flying chunk of rock. Catman, how is that sorceress of yours doing? Her spell is not yet complete, Gamaliel said sharply, his eyes flashing at the mere hint his mistress was not doing all she could. Just a question, Trooper grumped. No need to take it so personally. All right, I have an idea, Listel cried out. But I'm going to need you to distract old two heads here. Trooper looked at the elf suspiciously. What harebrained scheme are you? Just keep zombie breath occupied, all right, she replied. She traced an intricate pattern in the air with her fingers. Silvery sparks crackled about her feet, and suddenly she began to move so rapidly she blurred before their eyes. There was no time to doubt her strategy. The three warriors darted between the cascading rocks, reaching the pool's edge. They attacked. Kern with his hammer, Miltiades with his longsword, Trooper with his rune sword. More metallic tentacles lifted themselves from the pool, snaking wildly to parry their blows. But a few swings managed to slip through, landing against the mutant zombie's knees. It let out a roar and bent over to reach its foes with long, scythe-like claws. As a result... It did not see the silver streak that sped around the far side of the pool approaching on its blind side. Just then, Listel reached the melee, the silver sparks around her feet fading as her swiftness spell ended. Still distracted, the creature did not notice as the elf reached out a single finger and touched its flesh, whispering the words of a spell. Instantly, the guardian straightened, growing rigid. The dead eyes that had once been Serana stared into space, gazing at some imagined foe with a look equal parts horror and outrage. The dragon's maw snarled at a conjured enemy as the creature clawed futilely at thin air. Listel's illusion spell had worked. In its mind, the creature was now battling its worst nightmare. What sort of form that nightmare had taken, there was no way to know. But if the Guardian lost the imaginary battle, the consequences would prove fatal and very real. 
the elf grinned triumphantly at her fellow warriors. Suddenly, caught in the throes of its phantom battle, the guardian whirled. Its serpent tail whistled through the air, crackling like a gigantic whip as it struck Listel forcibly. The elf's delicate body was hurled through the air like a piece of chaff. She struck a pile of jagged rocks and did not move. Blood seeped from a wound on Listel's temple. No! Kern screamed in disbelief, taking a step toward the fallen elf. A hand on his shoulder halted him. Kern. It was Trooper, in his solemn voice. The battle is not over. Kern shook his head dumbly. Could an illusion? Could Listel die? At the same moment, Dale moved toward the edge of the pool, raising her bow. She felt a sick knot in her stomach, fear that Listel was dead. But Dale was determined that the elf's sacrifice would not be in vain, nor would her father's. Now was her chance for vengeance, while the creature was still distracted. Do not fail me now, Bo, she silently instructed her weapon. She knocked an arrow, raising the magical longbow. I am no sorcerer, a calm voice said behind her. But I do know that if you strike the creature with an arrow, the elf's spell will be broken. Dale froze. Gamaliel stepped before her. As always, the barbarian's chiseled face was impassive. Dale clenched her fingers. She ought to release the arrow right away. Her opportunity for vengeance could pass at any moment. But something in Gamaliel's eyes held her. A single arrow cannot slay this beast, he went on softly. The bow trembled in her grip. But I vowed to my father. Gamaliel reached out, clasping her wrist. Remember what I told you, he said quietly. Sometimes those with the wild gift lose themselves in the hunt. But this is not your hunt, Dale. He nodded toward Kern. It is his. Do not take that from him. A shadow touched the barbarian's lips. It might almost have been a smile. Fear not, Dale. You will have many opportunities in the years to come to honor your father's memory with your deeds. Slowly, Dale lowered the bow. I will honor him, she whispered fiercely. Gamaliel only nodded, his grip tightening. Kern! Trooper growled fiercely. Listel's spell won't last much longer. Act now. Use the hammer of Tyre. Kern was dazed and reacting slowly. Life was worth everything to Listel, Miltiades prompted quietly. Yet she was willing to risk her life for this quest. Do not let that sacrifice come to nothing. These words bit deep into Kern's heart. Suddenly he felt his fear, his anger, his confusion melt away. He whirled to face the mutant. The creature writhed before him, still tackling the phantom enemy that only its grotesque eyes could see. It lurched forward within range. With a cry to Tyre, Kern hurled the glowing hammer with all his might. This time, the metallic tentacles that reached up to snatch it out of the air were smashed. The hammer hit the guardian full in the chest. Blue lightning crackled, transfixing the zombie. In a heartbeat, the hammer returned to Kern's grip. What's going on? A clear voice asked. Yvain had woken from her spell. In her hand, she held the gem that had been bathed in the magical flame of her brazier. 
An energy pulsated inside the gym, first dark, then light, beating to a slow, steady rhythm. Is your spell complete, Yvain? Miltiades asked. It is, she frowned, noticing the gigantic mutant zombie struggling against the magic that encircled it. Something tells me I missed out on some highlights. We'll explain later, Kern cried hoarsely. I think now would be a good time to destroy the pool. Yvain smiled, her green eyes glinting with a dangerous light. With pleasure. She raised the pulsating gem and cast it into the pool of twilight. The crystal sank silently beneath the surface of the pool. At first, nothing happened. Kern wondered with a shiver of fear if Yvain's spell had misfired. Then he noticed a faint, pulsating spot where the gem had fallen into the pool. Glowing light, then dark, in a steady cadence. The waters of the pool swirled and bubbled, but the pulsing spot began to spread, stilling the waves. The pool surged in fury, water spouts reaching to the ceiling, but the pulsating circle continued to enlarge, its steady, calming rhythm unwavering. First dark, then light, then dark again. What's happening? Kern shouted above the roar of the waves. The pool fights to keep its chaotic nature, Yvain shouted back, but the magic within the gym is rhythmic, ordered. Metallic foam flew through the air. The guardian of the pool, the mutant zombie that was half Serana, half Dusk, screamed as it struggled against the holy magic that surrounded it. By now, all the pool was pulsating, dark, light, dark. The waves ebbed. The surface of the pool became as still as glass. Even the guardian became motionless, the dragon maw frozen in mid-scream. The pool went dark, so dark that all the light seemed to be drained out of the cavern. The blackness hurt Kern's eyes. He counted ten heartbeats in the ominous silence. Then, all of a sudden, the pool flared brilliantly, and everything went white white. The searing light seemed to burn right through stone and flesh. Ten more heartbeats, abruptly. Then the radiance dimmed. The pool of twilight was no more. A gaping pit yawned in the cavern floor where the pool had existed only moments before. All that was left of Serana and Dusk were their bones fused together in a death embrace. But even as the adventurers watched, those bones crumbled into dust. Yvain stumbled backward weakly, but Gamaliel caught her before she could fall. Her skin was pallid, eyes hollow, but she was smiling all the same. Damn, but I enjoy doing that. Carl's entire body glowed sapphire blue. Radiant light flowed through him, out of him, sustaining the shimmering wall that held the army of zombies at bay outside the gates of the Temple of Tyre. His faith had not dimmed, but he knew that his body was failing. Mere flesh was not strong enough to bear the raw, crackling magic that coursed through him. The azure radiance was consuming him ever faster. Still, his belief in Tyre did not waver. Whatever happened, Tarl knew he had done all that one man could do. The end draws close, Sister Sindara murmured to Anton. By Tyre, I can see right through his hands the patriarch said softly. They're made of light, just like the wall. Even as Anton watched, 
more and more of Tarl's form was transformed into shimmering light. The sapphire wall began to flicker and fade. The dark army of twisted zombies surged forward with an inhuman howl of victory. In moments, they would stream through the gates into the heart of the temple. Tarl could feel himself fading, growing more and more insubstantial. He channeled every last ounce of his strength into the magical wall, regretting only that he had not had the chance to say goodbye to Shal or to his son. The decomposing zombies shrieked in gleeful cacophony. They clawed past each other, pressing against the flickering barrier, ready to tear living flesh from bone. Then they abruptly collapsed. Each and every rotting abomination slumped to the ground like a puppet with its strings slashed. Even as the stunned clerics watched, their twisted bodies began to bubble and steam, evaporating in a noxious yellow cloud. Then a cold wind raced through the streets of the city, blowing the poisonous atmosphere away. Tarl, release the gate, Sister Sandara shouted, hobbling toward the white-haired cleric. It was hard, so hard, the power continued to stream through Tarl like water through a busted dam. It nearly washed him away. With his last shred of consciousness, he reached out and tried to shut off the energy. The azure radiance vanished. Tarl dropped to the ground. The others watching did not know if he was alive or dead. Then they saw a shuddering breath fill his chest. Thank tire he lives, Tarl heard a voice cry, but he hardly noticed, his mind filled with a single thought. You've done it, Kern. You've done it. Kern was the first to reach Listel. He saw that she lived, if barely. Her breathing was shallow her face deathly pale. Carefully, he lifted the elf. Her body felt light in his arms, her bones as insubstantial as a bird's. He laid her gently on the cloak Miltiadi spread on the ground. A faint light flickered in the ruby pendant at her throat. She's holding on by the barest thread, Yvain said resting a hand gently on Listel's brow. I think it's the necklace that's keeping her alive. The ruby's feeble flickering began to slow, growing dimmer. Can you do anything? Kern asked desperately. Slowly, Yvain shook her head. My magic cannot heal her, she paused. But a true paladin could. Kern looked at Trooper and Miltiades. It was the most precious gift that the god Tyre granted his paladins, the power to heal with a single touch. Please, he whispered urgently. Trooper gave him a sharp look, then knelt by the elf. He laid his hands against her temples. A pale blue glow shimmered about his fingertips. Listel took a shuddering breath. Then, her breathing grew shallow once again. Miltiades, help me. The skeletal knight knelt beside the venerable paladin. Miltiades removed his gauntlets and laid the bare, yellowed bones of his undead hands atop troopers. The older man flinched at the paladin's chilling touch, but he did not pull away. The blue glow brightened. The flow of blood from the wound on Listel's forehead slowed, then stopped. Still, she did not wait. The blue nimbus around Trooper's hands vanished. The deep sigh, the old man stood, his shaggy eyebrows drooping. It wasn't enough. We helped some, 
but her injuries are too dire. But she can't die, Hearn whispered hoarsely. Why? Trooper asked sternly. Because she's only an illusion? Is that what you still think? His blue eyes sparked fire. Well, if you do, you're more fool than I took you for, Kern de Sanya. And a waste of time at that. The paladin whirled and stomped away, leaving Kern speechless. There is one more who might save her, Miltiadi said in his sepulchral voice. Who? Kern demanded. The skeletal knight's empty eye sockets seemed to regard Kern silently. Kern's shoulders slumped as he realized what the undead paladin meant. But I can't help her, Miltiades, he said helplessly. I don't have the power. I'm only a paladin aspirant. I'm not really a paladin. If that is what you believe, then it is so. Miltiades intoned quietly. Kern looked to the others for help. Yvain, Gamaliel, Dale, all regarded him sadly, silently. There was nothing they could do to help him, nothing at all. It was up to him to act. He made a decision. Confusion became calm. No, Miltiades, he clenched his jaw tightly. I spoke wrongly. I am a paladin. He reached out and laid his hands on Listel's brow. By Tyre, I believe I am. Blue light flared brilliantly about his hands. The wound on Listel's forehead dimmed to a faint shadow, then vanished. For a moment, her breathing halted altogether. But the azure radiance beat brightly. Then her chest began to rise and fall in a gentle rhythm. The light in her ruby pendant began to glow steadily. The blue nimbus faded. Kern lifted his hands, staring at them in amazement. Listel stirred, her silvery eyes fluttering open. What's everybody grinning at? The elf asked in annoyance, her voice weak but clear. You, Kern said with a grateful laugh. He stood lifting her easily to her feet and pressing his lips to hers. He stepped away, smiling broadly. The elf's eyes widened. She opened her mouth to say something, but no words would come out. For the first time in her life, Listel on a pordom found herself completely speechless. Chapter 20 Paladin's Promise Trooper stood in the shadow of a huge stalagmite, a short distance from the others who were still tending to their battle wounds. A faint, bluish light shone about the old paladin as he argued adamantly with another voice only he could hear. It's not as if I was constantly asking you for favors, you know. Trooper whispered cantankerously, his shaggy eyebrows bristling. Did I ask for a reward when I rescued that twittering, pea-brained, procampurian princess from that cobbled din in the Stonelands? No. Did I expect any payment for destroying the beast cult of Malar when they had their mangy jackals harrying the highway from Cormir to the caravan cities? No! Did I complain when I had to wade through the sewers beneath the biggest goblining warren in Ferun just so I could spy on that dull-witted orc god for you? He cocked his head, listening to the reply. Well, all right. Perhaps I did in that case, he admitted with a snort. But mind you, it was three years before the smell finally wore off. He shook his head, 
his long white beard wagging. But that's not the point. I said that you owed me one when I agreed to help the young pup, and I meant it. Now the lad's a true paladin. That means my work is done. Trooper's steely eyes flashed resolutely. It's time to settle our deal, Tyre. The blue haze about him flickered for a moment. Trooper listened to the words no other could have heard. Nonsense, he replied gruffly. I've lived a long life, and a good one, if I do say so myself. He sighed sinking down to sit on a low shelf of stone. He was silent for a short while. I'm tired, Tyre, he muttered finally. Don't you see? I've had more than enough adventures to comprise a lifetime. But there's one who has served you loyally, who has never had these opportunities. He stole a glance back at the others. Miltiadi stood slightly apart from his companions, watching them with what seemed, despite his fleshless face, a sorrowful expression. He's done the deeds in death he never had the chance to do in life. Don't you think that's worth something? Trooper blew a breath through his drooping mustache. And you don't even have to worry about that precious balance of yours, one life for another. What could be more just than that? Trooper scratched his beard, listening. Then he grinned. I knew you'd come around to reason. His expression grew wistful as he watched his questing companions. It's funny but I think I'm going to miss them, especially that impertinent elf, he scowled. I always was a fool for dimples. He sat up straighter, his old joints creaking in protest. Well, I'm ready, he whispered, annoyed. Get on with it. The blue light flared brightly about the old paladin then dimmed. Miltiades! Dread gripped Yvain's voice. What's wrong? The undead paladin stumbled backward, as if jolted. Kern, Listel, Dale, and Gamaliel looked around at him in concern. Azure tendrils of light twined themselves about his armored form. A shimmering blue coil gently lowered the visor of his helm, concealing the bare bones of his face. My, my quest has ended, the knight said solemnly. I fear that my time here is at an end. He doubled over, his gauntleted hands clenched into fists. Tyre calls me home once more. He sank to his knees. No, Yvain cried. She reached out for him. It was too late. Like an empty suit of tipped-over armor, Miltiades buckled to the ground. The sapphire light surrounding him faded and was gone. He lay utterly still. All stared in shocked silence. I'm sorry, Yvain, Kern said finally, his voice thick with emotion. I don't think there will ever be another hero like him. He was the first person I ever met who truly understood me, Listel added, tears glistening in her eyes. I'm going to miss him. As are we all. Gamaliel said gruffly. He put his hands on Yvain's shoulders, leading her gently but firmly away from the paladin. Come, Yvain, we must. The suit of steel armor twitched. 
all watched in amazement as the shining suit of armor shifted again. Then, slowly, the fallen knight pulled himself to his feet, standing tall. Yvain let out a deep breath of relief. Miltiades, are you... are you all right? She took a hesitant step toward him. The ancient paladin shook his helm as if he was dizzy or unsure. I... I think so, Yvain, he said. But there was something strange about his voice. Tentatively, he raised a gauntlet and lifted his visor. Yvain gasped. By all the gods, she murmured. The others stared at the knight with their own expressions of wonder. Slowly, hardly daring to believe what she saw was real, Yvain reached out a hand and brushed Miltiati's cheek. Her fingers touched warm skin. Yvain, what's wrong? Miltiades asked in concern. You're crying. She shook her head, trying to speak but unable to find the words. He still didn't realize what had happened. In answer, she reached for his hand and pulled off one of his steel gauntlets. He stared in shock when he saw the flesh-covered hand that was exposed. By Tyre, he whispered softly. I'm alive. Yvain laughed for joy, throwing her arms around the handsome, dark-haired knight. His blue eyes shone with surprise. Then he returned the embrace. Excuse me, Yvain, Listel said wryly, after this embrace had gone on for more than a few moments. But there are some other people who would like a chance to hug Miltiades, too. Yvain flushed in embarrassment, but Listel only grinned as she threw her arms around the two of them. Kern, Dale, and Gamaliel followed suit, their laughter filling the cavern. It wasn't until later that they discovered Trooper. They found the old paladin sitting on a low spur of stone, his eyes closed, a faintly mischievous smile resting on his lips. Heavy golden beams of sunlight slanted down from the jagged hole in the cavern's roof, igniting the old man's hair in a fiery halo. They did not need to feel for his heartbeat to know that he was dead. He has passed on to Tyre's halls now, Miltiades said gravely. Yvain reached out and squeezed his hand tightly. Listel wept bitterly, burying her head in her hands as Dale did her best to comfort the elf. Kern knelt beside Trooper's lifeless body, not trying to hide the tears that rolled down his own cheeks. Thank you, was all he whispered softly. On a brilliant winter solstice day, Kern ceremonially returned the Hammer of Tyre to its rightful place in the temple. It was an auspicious day for the ritual, Sister Sindara said, for it was the day when the sun began its trek northward and the days grew longer once more, heralding the coming spring. There were other good omens as well, for a legendary paladin walked the world again, the temple's clerics had observed Miltiades with awe these last few days. However, Miltiades did not mind. He was used to being stared at, if for different reasons. As Kern walked to the temple's nave, bearing the hammer, the sign of hope most important to him came in the form of a tall, regal, red-haired woman who sat on a marble bench. As he neared her, the beautiful woman stood and kissed him on the cheek. You've grown handsome, my son, she murmured. 
Kern blushed. Thank you, Mother. Only the barest traces of shadow lingered in the sorceress's cheeks. The hammer of Tyre had healed her almost completely of the injury caused to her by the guardian of the pool. No, Kern, a gruff, cantankerous voice seemed to whisper in his mind. The hammer didn't heal Shal. You healed her. Kern looked around, wondering where the voice came from. Though he had a suspicion, he knew enough not to argue. Shal returned to her seat next to Tarl, gripping his hand affectionately. The white-haired cleric smiled proudly, even though he could not see his son. Despite its powers, the hammer of Tyre had not cured Tarl's blindness. While this had saddened Kern, his father had told him to put his sorrow aside. Whether he could see or not, Tarl knew that he was the same man as before, except perhaps a little bit wiser. Kern couldn't help but chuckle as he passed his grinning friends on the way to the ornate marble altar. Anton nodded to him solemnly then. It was time. In the name of Tyre, Kern called out, I return this relic to its rightful place. He set the hammer down upon the altar. The next day, Flan started to change. True, there was little enough different to meet the eye. The streets were still dark and sullen, littered with refuse, the buildings lining them dilapidated and crumbling. But as Kern walked through the city, here and there, he noticed small things that gave him cause for hope. For the first time in recent memory, the tall smokestacks looming over the city no longer belched forth black, sulfurous smoke. A steady breeze from the moon sea was already clearing the gloomy cloud hanging over Flan. People had been trickling back into the city these last days. Most of them seemed a bit dazed, as if they had just woken from a dark nightmare. They stared at the city in dismay, as if only truly seeing it for the first time. Slowly, they began to rebuild their lives. Kern passed an old woman planting lily bulbs in a flower bed in front of her clabbered hovel. A group of raggedly clad children ran by, laughing merrily. He strolled past a tavern and realized it was the one he had passed with Tarl and Listel the day they had gone to the temple to learn the answer to Bane's riddle. Odd, he thought, that it seems so long ago now. He watched as the innkeep busily painted over the sign that had once read, The Bloated Corpse. Now it read, The Golden Feather. A more auspicious name to Kern's mind. A pretty young woman threw open the tavern's shuttered windows, whistling a cheerful tune. Kern shook his head. Already the grip of the dark gods was loosening. It would be a long time until Flan was truly healed, he knew, perhaps years. But with the hammer of Tyre returned to its rightful place, the healing had begun. Nor would the clerics of Tyre stand idle. Already, Anton and Tarl were concocting plans to help restore the city. Kern found his traveling companions in the main room of Dinlor's tower, Tarl was upstairs with Shal. Though the sorceress seemed all but recovered, Tarl had forbidden her from working until he was certain she was fully rejuvenated. If I don't start doing some magic soon, I'm liable to forget how to cast a spell altogether, she had complained. But Tarl had not been swayed, and neither Kern nor Listel were about to argue with the brawny, white-haired cleric. Kern was dismayed, but not surprised to see Dale packing her belongings. It's time I return to the Valley of the Falls, she explained, slinging her magical bow over her shoulder. She smiled wryly. 
If I stay away too long, the orcs will start thinking they own the place. He laughed and hugged her tightly. Well, we can't have that, Kern told her. After all, what would Wren think? Keep him out of trouble, Listel, Dale told the elf, as if Kern were not listening, a habit she and the elf had which annoyed him to no end. The elf snorted, as if this was a good joke. You wrangled your orcs, Dale. Leave Kern to me. Her words sounded vaguely ominous, but Kern wasn't quite certain why. Dale left the tower, promising to visit soon. But when Kern glanced out the window, he noticed that the young ranger had paused to talk to Gamaliel. Yvain's familiar was in his human form. The two spoke together for a moment, and Dale gripped the barbarian's hand tightly. Then she was gone. Kern didn't know what had passed between them, but Gamaliel stood in the courtyard until the dusk began to gather, gazing off to where Dale had vanished. A voice spoke behind him. I just talked to Brookwine and Winebrook. Primal is moving on. Startled, Kern turned to see Listel step out of a wall, her ruby pendant flashing. Won't you ever get tired of that trick? He asked in a perturbed voice. She thought about it for a moment. Probably not, she decided. Suddenly, her words struck him. What did you mean, Primal is moving on? Listel sighed. He and the two mages are going to find a new hiding place. Safahir's minion came too close for comfort. It's only a matter of time until another one of his servants discovers the grove in the forest. Primal wants to make certain he's long gone by then. A coldness gathered in the pit of Kern's stomach. Are you... are you going with him? She regarded him curiously with her brilliant eyes. Do you want me to, Kern? I want you to be safe, Listel. If that mage, she interrupted him. That wasn't what I asked, he thought for a long moment. No, he said finally. I want you to stay, Listel. Good, she said with a laugh. Because you're stuck with me, Kern Dasania. He wasn't certain if he had just received a prize or a prison sentence. Kern had learned on his journey that there was more to the diminutive elf than met the eye. Much more. And something told him he had only scratched the surface. But no matter what surprises she held for him or what secrets she kept, he knew now that there would always be a place for her in his heart. I don't think I'm ever going to figure you out, Listel he said finally, shaking his head in exasperation. No, she said musingly, I don't suppose you ever will. With that, she stood on her tiptoes and kissed him fleetingly. Then, with a flicker of her ruby pendant, she vanished through the stone wall, leaving him alone. For a long while, he stared outside into the gathering night. An image came to him, of a dark tower rising above a storm-swept sea, he shivered. I'll never let Safar here hurt you again, Listel, he whispered to the knight. By my oath as a paladin, never. He turned his back on the darkened window, returning to warm firelight and companionship. It was late, the moon rose over Flan, veiling the city in gossamer light. Everyone in Denlor's tower was asleep, except for two figures that stood upon a high balcony, braving the cold winter night. What now? Yvain asked softly. She seemed to be questioning herself as much as her companion. Her long hair shone in the pale moonlight. The sorceress was not a pretty woman in any conventional sense. But the pearly illumination lent a softness to her sharp features and piercing eyes. 
We've both been granted second chances, Yvain, Miltiades replied. I suppose we both have to decide what to do with them. Yvain marveled at the paladin's rich voice, so warm and burnished, now that the sepulchral echo was gone. But I have decided, she turned to face him. The cold wind tangled his long, dark hair. Gods, but he was handsome, she thought. But it was not his strong features that enthralled her. It was his eyes, as dark as his hair and brimming with vitality. There are still pools in Ferun, Miltiades, she went on. I can't give up my quest now. He nodded in perfect understanding. I, too, have quests to finish, he said softly, though they may be centuries old. The sorceress smiled crookedly. The two were silent for a time. Suddenly, Yvain shivered, the winter chill creeping into her bones. Gently, Miltiades drew her to him. Once before, she had tried to embrace him, and the chill had numbed her fingers. But this time his touch was warm and welcome. Our quest may not be over, she murmured, but maybe, maybe this once, we can leave them until tomorrow. Until tomorrow, he echoed. Their embrace grew tighter, fiercer. Then, arm in arm, they stepped inside, shutting out the darkness behind them. Moments later, a figure stirred in the shadows. Gamaliel moved into the moonlight. A faint smile touched the barbarian man's lips. Suddenly, his form blurred. A tawny cat vanished stealthily into the night, leaving the balcony empty. About the Authors One of TSR's best-known writers and game masters, James M. Ward, is author or designer of numerous titles, including board games, modules, and novels. He was co-author of both Pools of Darkness and Pool of Radiance. A lifelong Wisconsin resident, James is married and has three children. A TSR games editor, Anne K. Brown, was co-author of the popular Pools of Darkness. A graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Anne lives in Milwaukee with her husband Richard, daughter Emily, and Kat Baxter. <laughs>